frightening moments in his career. Perhaps it will be Mark Martin, currently third in the points. Mark won four races in a row last season. That tied a NASCAR record. Thank you. Kyle Petty is a new look for NASCAR. The Petty name has been with the sport since its origins on the beach of Daytona in the 50s. Kyle has not enjoyed the racing success of his dad, Richard, but a win here today can take the legendary name further yet. Or might it be 23-year-old Jeff Gordon, who grew up a few miles from the brickyard. Last May, he became a proven winner on the NASCAR circuit. He always dreamed of racing here, but never would have guessed it would be in a stock car. By day's end, there will be new history. 400 miles from now, the Ray Haroon of this age will be known. A new tradition begins. NASCAR has come to the Brickyard. Live from the world capital of auto racing, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, ABC Sports presents the inaugural running of the Brickyard 400. You are about to watch the making of history. Welcome to Indianapolis, I'm Paul Payne. Stock cars on the Brickyard. 30 years ago, when I first came here to cover the 500, I asked that question. The fans will only come for one race a year was the universal answer. And for 78 years, it has been true. And there has been only one event each year, the Indy 500. But now, NASCAR has grown up. The stock cars that only once thundered the tracks of the Southeast have developed fanatical fans nationwide. Times have changed. And NASCAR's fans and the Speedway are ready. Today, twice as many fans as ever attended a stock car race are jammed into the grandstands here. Now, the Speedway got its nickname the Brickyard because it was first paved with brick. With the exception of three feet at the start-finish line, those bricks are now under the asphalt surface. For the first 500, a million 200,000 bricks were laid. Today's purse, coincidentally, is three million two hundred thousand dollars. So the Brickyard 400 has already made history as NASCAR's biggest and richest race, and there is more to come. Now joining us today for live coverage is former NASCAR champion Benny Parsons and the most experienced TV race caller in NASCAR, Bob Jenkins. Thank you, Paul, and hi, everyone. You know, one of the interesting aspects of this event is that everybody came here on an even level. We have had many testing sessions and two days of practice, but Benny, do they really know how it's going to be like until the green flag drops? Bob, they have no idea. 39 of these driver, drivers have never driven a race here. They have no idea what it's going to be like 20, 30 laps into the race. It's a guessing game, and the best guesser may win. Is this just another Winston Cup event? It might be when the green flag drops. For the last three days, this has been the biggest event in these guys' mind in their life. Paul, we'll see how things shape out when the green flag drops in just a few moments. Well, the official ceremonies are underway. The crews standing in the pit area, the cars on the track just north of the start-finish line in rows of two, ready to take the start of this race. And, of course, the fans are packed into the grandstands here, ready for the inaugural running of the Brickyard 400. told is I found the one dead spot and I'm not in the same spot yeah
camera coming here. And I'm going to talk to him. The preparations and the testing started some 18 months ago, and now we're less than a minute away from what 43 drivers have waited over those 18 months. And Rick Mast is on the pole. Rick, some last-minute thoughts before you get ready for the command here at Indy. Showtime's over, man. It's time for the race. 160th lap. That's what we're after. He says that he's not concerned about winning the pole. He wants Paul Page to go to the bottom, to go to the end as we get the flyby traditionally here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, now part of the tradition of the Brickyard 400. Paul? And Rick Mass sits quietly for the moment, but very soon, uh, thunder will roar out. There's Any Mary Fendrick Holman ready to give the, the command. We go down to the There's start the finish line for the introduction of that moment's most famous command in sports. The Chairman Emeritus of the Board of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, Mrs. Mary F. Hallman. Gentlemen, start your engines. <laughs> Junior Johnson, back in the 60s, you tried to qualify for the Indy 500. Did you ever think you'd hear the command of fire engines or stock cars at the Brickyard? Well, no, I didn't, Jackie. This is a great event, and uh, I think it's a historical event if we'll all remember the rest of our lives and all of the people that come here from now on will just be secondary. Two-car team here, Jimmy Spencer and Bill Elliott. What are your odds of winning it? I think we got good odds. Both of them running good. Bill's running exceptional well. If he stays out of trouble and uh, finishes this race, he's going to be there. Well, let's throw it down to Jerry Punch. Jerry? Walking along with a man who's a former driver and now a car owner for Dale Earnhardt, where you've won five championships. Richard Childress, what does this day mean for you? Well, I think it's a great mark in the history of stock car racing. You know, it's uh, but for Richard Childress and our team uh, to win this would be great. Any doubt in your mind who's going to lead that first lap? Well, I know where my money is laying on is, uh, you know, Dale, he, you know, we're going to run as hard as we can. I'm sure he's got him in plan lined up to, to try to lead that first lap. They don't call Dale Earnhardt the intimidator for nothing. He wants to lead first time by, but so does Rick Mast. Paul? Well, one tradition they did keep was the tradition of releasing thousands of balloons, in this case, yellow and purple balloons into the air. Let's take a look at the starting field. On the pole, Rick Mast, only his second pole of his career, alongside is Dale Earnhardt, in search of a seventh series title. Row two, Jeff Gordon, who won his first race this last May in his 42nd start. And Jeff Bodine, a winner two races ago at Pocono. In the third row, Bobby Labonte, who looks for his first top five finish of the year. And Bill Elliott, the 60, uh, 1988 series champion who hasn't won since November of 92. In the fourth row is Brett Bodine. His only career win came on a short track in 1990. And Ricky Rudd, a winner three races ago in New Hampshire, his first run as a car owner. In the fifth row is Sterling Marlin and Mark Martin, row number six. Morgan Shepard and Rusty Wallace in the seventh row as they begin to pull away Greg Sachs and Dale Jarrett. In row eight, Michael Waltrip and Dave Marcus. The ninth row, Ernie Irvin and Jeff Brabham. Row 10, Rich Bickle and Hutt Strickland. The 11th row, Terry Labonte and Wally Dollenbach Jr. The 12th row, Kenny Schrader and Jimmy Hensley. In row 13, Todd Bodine and Danny Sullivan. Row 14, Daryl Waltrip and John Andretti. Row 15, Jeff Purvis and Joe Nemechek. The 16th row, on the inside, Jeremy Mayfield and Bobby Hamilton. And there they go, they begin to roll away. The 17th row, Ward Burton and Jimmy Spencer. The 18th row, Bobby Hillen and Kyle Petty. Row 19, Ted Musgrave and Jeff Burton. In row 20, Derek Cope and A.J. Boyd. And in row 21, Lake Speed and Harry Gant. And alone in the 22nd row is Mike Chase. So there they are. And aren't they pretty on the speedway? The pace car is Chevrolet Monte Carlo. Elmo Langley, of course, the 
driver of the pace car. No celebrities here today. Well, I hope Belmo doesn't get mad at me for saying that. He certainly is a celebrity. And the field lined up behind him. Let's go to the pits. Gary Gerald. John Andretti. That's his car. Well, finally he gets it started and pulls away. Let's go to Gary Gerald. Well, Paul, so much excitement, so many unanswered questions, all the hype, all the hoopla. It's now over. Those questions are about to be answered. We know that it's going to place a premium today on pit stops because of the uncertainty of if you can pass and what's this race going to be like. A lot of pressure on the crews. We expect this first stops around lap 34 to lap 36. That would dictate a four-stop race in this 400-mile event. However, some of these teams are notorious for getting good fuel mileage. If you can squeak out an extra four laps on a tank of fuel, you could make this a three-stop race. Guys like Daryl Waltrip, Kenny Schrader, Ricky Rudd, they've been very good at it in the past. If they can do that today, it may give them a big advantage. Paul? Could be a very tactical race. Now, 400 miles here is 160 laps. We've already indicated that giant first. And the historic pole sitter, Rick Mast, at 172.41 four miles an hour and there they are here's the breakdown of the cars in this field 23 Fords, 15 chevys five pontiacs 31 on goodyear 12 on hoosier tires here's jack aroot well, anyway, the car's different here paul but also the pit rules in winston cup competition the leaders under caution are allowed to pit on the first open lap then the cars that are one lap or further in arrears, they can come onto pit road. There's a speed limit of 65 miles an hour. The cars are in delineated stalls. If you put your nose over that stall, you're given an infraction penalty. More importantly, there's no radar guns to enforce the speed limit. They have a series of lines. If you go from one line to the other in too much time, you're brought in for a black flag penalty. It's two laps until they go to the green flag. Here are the point standings. Only 400 points separate first from seventh in the standings with 13 races to go. It's a spectacular fight that's going to continue to the end of the season. So there is that question, too, of tires here. Let's go to Jerry Punt. Well, Paul, for those that are unfamiliar with NASCAR racing, there are two competing tire companies here, corporate giant Goodyear and Tiny Hoosier out of nearby Lakeville, Indiana. Now, the idea when you have a tire war is to build a soft tire and go fast but last. Today in qualifying, or earlier in qualifying, Hoosier won that battle. Their car's on the pole. But I gotta give a nod to Goodyear for the race. They have not lost a race at Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the past 23 years. But no one knows, will it be Hoosier from Lakeville or Goodyear at Victory Lane for the inaugural Brickyard 400? Paul? So many stories to watch here today. A perfect day for racing. You really couldn't ask for better weather. 70 degrees, a little cool for this time of year, but it's going to be sunny throughout the afternoon. And now, as the cars roll onto the backstretch in Indianapolis, here to call the Brickyard 400 in its inaugural running is the television voice of NASCAR, Bob Jenkins. Thank you, Paul. A beautiful sight as the cars come around corner number two and head down the long back stretch. Next time they're on this particular area of the racetrack, they will be working up to full speed. You see the drivers moving their cars back and forth, trying to get those tires very clean. And there is the in-car camera, actually the roof cam on Daryl Waltrip's car. He'll be having some great shots for us this afternoon. His brother, Michael Waltrip, also carries one of our in-car cameras. Bill Elliott, who finished second at Talladega a couple of weeks ago. He has a camera. We're looking back on Ricky Rudd. And Kyle Petty, we're looking back from his mellow yellow Pontiac. Bob, these fellows have rode by all these people. They have never seen as many fans as we have here in Indianapolis today. They are excited, but in just a moment, it's back to business. They work through the north end of the racetrack. Now between turns number three and four, Rick Mast on the pole in car number one. It's Dale Earnhardt on the outside of the front row. Jeff Gordon will start from third position. Now they make their way around corner number four as Elmo Langley has the pace car position to pull it off of the racetrack. The eyes of the entire sports world are focused at this moment on 300 acres of real estate in the northwest section of Indianapolis, Indiana. A new tradition begins as the green flag is about to come out to signal the beginning of the inaugural Brickyard 400. And the 
fleet is out. Just another race. All the hype is over. These guys now can worry about winning the first brickyard. Can they race two abreast through the corners? You bet they can. We saw it in the first and second corners. Rick Mast has the lead as they come down the back stretch with Dale Earnhardt tucked in right behind him. But Jeff Gordon is trying to make a move on Earnhardt for the second position in the third turn. But he did not get it. Now Mast still has the lead as they head through corner number three into corner number four. And that move that Jeff Gordon made on the inside of Earnhardt probably led a great man's lead that first lap. In 78 previous runnings of the Indy 500, 151 different drivers have led a lap. Rick Mast has become the first to lead a lap in the history of competitive stock car racing, and that's the first time he has ever led a first lap of any race. There's Labonte on the inside of Earnhardt trying to push him back to fifth spot, and Elliott's going to try to get alongside Earnhardt coming off two. So Earnhardt falling back a few spots here in the early going of the race. Perhaps the car isn't working quite as well as he had hoped it would. Bobby Labonte, Dale Earnhardt, Bill Elliott, then Brett Bodine and Ricky Rudd as they go into three. Earnhardt, as a matter of fact, touched the wall as he came out of turn number four. Watch this. He's running in second position at this moment. This was last lap ago. Oh, he hit it pretty good, Benny. He hit it pretty good, and I'm sure that Richard Childress and that crew are concerned. Bill Elliott has gotten by him, and here's a lot of other cars trying to get by Earnhardt down the front straightaway. Look at him. Four abreast. At the line, they're four abreast in a battle for position as Jeff Gordon has taken over the lead from Rick Mast. But Mass is coming back on the inside trying to retake the lead, but Gordon holds it coming off the second corner. Jacker Root has a report on Dale Earnhardt. Well, Bob, Dale Earnhardt and Rick Mass came together on the start, and it, in that shunt, they think they may have bent the rear just a little bit. They're not sure down here. In fact, they are trying to radio to Dale right now, but they are going to try and keep him out as long as possible. That's why he hit the wall coming out. Well, Benny, he hit it hard enough that he could have very definitely sustained some damage to that car. Yes, he did, Bob. There we see Jeff Bodine, the Exide Battery car, won the race at Pocono about a month ago. And we are yellow for the first time in the inaugural Brickyard 400 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Huge break for Dale Earnhardt. Huge break for Dale Earnhardt. There is debris in turn number one. That's the reason that we are under yellow for the first time in the inaugural Brickyard 400 at Indianapolis. We'll be right back. for tires. I don't have a camera, so uh, you're going to play it from the high side? Okay. What was it? The side windows out of the 99 car. Oh. And he has to have one. Guys, the fender is rubbing on the right rear tire on Earnhardt's crew. Jackie Earnhardt's hit car. the wall pretty good with yeah. both the right and yeah. rear front. Yeah. 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 Oh, and, and Mast, who was that that hit it? Okay. It was Mast. That's what I said. Okay. Okay.
at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and Dale Earnhardt is in the pits having that car checked over. They're changing the four tires, and they're also getting the, the metal off. Let's watch the start of the race as Rick Mass and Earnhardt goes down in turn one, and we can see the cars do touch just as they get the apex of turn one. And then in turn number four, the car got way up high as it exited the corner, and he made contact with the barrier. Yes, watch Earnhardt as he comes off the corner and goes just, bam, right in the wall, and that can upset the toe in on the car. Now we are under caution because the side window blew out of the number 99 car. There you can see it flying off. And also notice now that it comes down on the racetrack. Harry Gant will run over it. Wow. That was the side window out of the Sullivan car. And there he is in the pit area. You have to have under NASCAR rules that side window has to be in the car. So we, the, we see the fellows taping the window in. Also, Harry Gant has made a pit stop to check the damage on his car after hitting that window. Gary Gerald is in Danny Sullivan's pit. He came in and there was a consultation with an NASCAR official. He shut the engine down and everybody kind of stood around. The crew didn't realize what the problem was. Then they got the spare. You see them now trying to tape it into place. A very time-consuming process. And after Danny qualified, Yesterday did such a terrific job to qualify 26th overall. Now the engine is off once again. And so the problems continue here early for one of the four men in this field who has now of this racetrack. As a matter of fact, of course, he was famous for the spin and win at the Indianapolis 500 in the mid-80s. The green flag waves once again. We're back under competition. It is Jeff Gordon who is leading, but look at the cars fan out at the back of the pack to shuffle for position. position here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is going to be a premium today. Staying up front is going to be very important. Earnhardt all the way in the back of the field. Hurts him a great deal. Of course, most of the drivers and crews name their cars, and Jeff Gordon has called his car Booker because it was so difficult to get the handle when it was originally built. Now we see Mark Martin losing a couple of positions to Dale Jarrett and Ernie Irvin. And there goes Irvin on the inside of Dale Jarrett. And many drivers said that in the short shoots would be a prime opportunity for passing. They said if they can't race two abreast in the corners, that they would have an opportunity to make a pass in the short shoots, and we've seen that already today. I stopped and talked to Ernie Irvin this morning, and he was very confident. He had a great race car, and it looks like he does. There's Morgan Shepard and Rusty Wallace. Ernie Irvin right behind them and Dale Jarrett. And Rusty just made the pass on Morgan Shepard. Rusty Wallace driving for Roger Penske South. Roger hoping that he can pull off the double. His driver, Alan Sir Jr., of course, won here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for the 500, and he hopes that his driver, Rusty Wallace, can win the Brickyard 400. Currently in ninth position, Rusty Wallace from Fenton, Missouri. Jack Aroot has a report on Rick Mast. Well, Bob, we checked with the crew to see if Rick Mast reported any problems or change in handling characteristics on his car. They said there is not a problem. We'll watch for another pass here. Change of second position as Jeff Bodine has gotten around to his Hoosier teammate, Rick Mast, for second spot. I think Rick Mast right now is just worrying about, as he keeps saying, that 160th lap. He's had, his car has run well this year, Bob, but he's had a lot of problems. He wants to be there at the end if he possibly can, as we see Bill Elliott passing Bobby Labonte for fourth spot. Jerry Punch has a report on Jeff Gordon, who's setting the pace here in the early going. Guys, you may not want to hear this, but a moment ago, the crew radio Jeff Gordon said, stay in place, do not pull away, let's not show everything we've got yet. So if he's not showing everything he's got, the field could be in serious trouble. Jerry, his radio must not be working. <laughs> he is definitely opening up a little bit of an advantage between himself and Jeff Bodine and Rick Mass as they continue to run in second and third position. 
And there we see Bill Elliott continuing on his way towards the front. Junior Johnson was right. Bill Elliott is running extremely well. And now, Benny, we've talked about how you really don't know how this race is going to go. You don't know what strategy to use. But by this time, the drivers probably do have an idea of what they're going to do. They have an idea of how the chassis is working. They've been ready on the crew and saying, I'm loose, I'm pushing, do this, do that. Now the 3,300 foot backstretch. We ride with Bill Elliott into turn number three. As we get inside Bill Elliott's car, we can see the telemetry. We have RPM, miles per hour. And we can see he's in fourth gear, not hitting the brakes. 194, five, 190, 203 miles an hour, maximum speed down the front straightaway. But notice how that speed drops off into the low 150s in the corners. Now up to about 175 in the short shoot. And, and we saw him hit the brake up in, coming off in turn two. RPM, 78, 9, 82, 83, 84, 8,400 RPM, 8,600. How do they stay together? So Bill Elliott continues to hang on to that fourth position. He runs behind Rick Mast, Jeff Bodine, and the leader of the race after nine laps. And 27, Jimmy Spencer is in the wall. And some heavy, heavy contact with that McDonald's car. Must be up between three and four. So for the second time in our race, the caution flag comes out as Jimmy Spencer is parked against the outside retaining wall and heavy damage to the right side of the McDonald's board. And Spencer will not win two races in a row. Let's take a look at it. Well, there was smoke coming from the car. He's just simply trying to get on the brakes, Benny. Yes, the brakes. He's got the brakes locked up. I just like the tire went flat or he had a flat as he went in the corner, or maybe the accelerator hung as he went in turn three. Well, one of the hottest drivers in NASCAR Winston Cup racing has encountered a problem here in the early going. He's won two races so far in 1994. So the caution is out. Jeff Gordon is the leader. And we'll be back with more from the Brickyard 400 after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. We're fine. I'm having a ball. You yes, fine. sir. Yes, sir. -y. You guys are doing good. We're just, just there. The, there you go. The pit road is closed. Man. Oh boy. Yeah, that's a good. Is Jimmy okay? Jeez, that's good. <clears throat> Back out there. I have wide world as well. Yep. Yeah, we need to yeah, establish where Earnhardt is. Yeah. But he'll probably stay out now in the rest of the car's pit. No, they got his board out. Is that is that a fake? Uh huh. <clears throat> Ooh, those seven car, yeah. He's still in there? Still in there. There's, they were reporting there was a problem with Earnhardt. He was smelling gasoline in the cockpit.
Indianapolis, the Brickyard 400. I'm Paul Page, and we are under our second yellow of the day. The first one for an accident, that involving Jimmy Spencer. They just put him in the ambulance. Uh, he climbed out of the car very hesitantly and favored his right arm as he walked to the ambulance. So we'll look for a further update on that as they put the car on the hook and take it back to the garage area. We take another look at the accident. There you see Spencer's car just veering for the wall. And when he slammed it, he slammed it very hard. So we're still under yellow. Coming up next, the USA's Michelle Kwan competes in the ladies figure skating competition on a special edition of ABC's Wide World of Sports. From St. Petersburg, Russia, it's the Goodwill Games. And tomorrow at 1.30 Eastern, 12.30 Pacific, coverage continues with ice dancing and the women's basketball gold medal game. All of that here on ABC Sports this weekend. So we are under yellow here at the Speedway. Dale Earnhardt went into the pits from 33rd position to try and get some repairs to make his car competitive. What's up? There we go. Hey, Benny and uh, Bob, what they did is they they figured what they would do. They figured what they would do is go and uh, work on the car. They could try to get the rear toe straightened out. On Earnhardt's car? On Earnhardt's car, yeah. <laughs> is he behind the wall? No, no RC. It just came in. I see you. RC said, what the heck, track position. Yeah. He says, we might as well take advantage of it. Yeah, if, those, if all the lead cars had fitted, he probably would have stayed out. Right, right. But since they didn't. All right. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I Goodrich. can give you an update. Hospital injury. Bob Goodrich. Boy, there we go. Bob, <laughs> Bob, Bob, I can give you an update on Spencer. He he'd hurt his shoulder at Wilkesboro several weeks back, and they think that that may have something oh, to do with right, it. Oh, that's right. In a test. That was three or four months ago. Yeah. Bobby, we can comment on the number of the drivers, including Jeff Gordon, have a push in the car. Okay. 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 it for me, I can give you a report on second and third, how their cars are working. Gary Gerald. Yep. All right. Uh, right now, it sounds like it's fine. I was hearing the interference. I didn't know where it was coming from. Welcome back to ABC's live coverage of the inaugural Brickyard 400 NASCAR Winston Cup race from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Our second caution is out because of an accident involving Jimmy Spencer. We get an update from Gary Gerald. Bob, we talked with Mike for that particular team, and they were saying that uh, he only radioed in and said that he got into the wall. They don't know how it happened, but he said he's had a problem with his shoulder that he hurt uh, two or three months ago at North Wilkesboro early in the season. He thinks that's the pain he was complaining of. You saw him walk to the ambulance, and he thinks that perhaps he's aggravated that injury to the shoulder. That's the word from his pit crew packing up and headed for the garage area as we go to Jerry Punch. And Gary, just a minute ago, one of Jimmy Spencer's crew members just ran back out of the garage area and yelled at me and said, hey, I think what happened was we flat spotted some tires and cut a tire down. When Jimmy had to jam on the brakes, we just went back and looked at the car. They were pulling it in. They think all four tires were flat spotted. I'm in the leader's pit, Jeff Gordon. He has a pretty significant push. He and Ernie Irvin, a couple other competitors, complaining that the car will not turn in the corners. Let's check in with Jack Aroot. Well, Jerry, the man that's running in second place, he complains of a push as well. And that is Jeff Bodine. The quote to his crew was, man, this thing is pushing like a dump truck. But the same cannot be said for third place driver Rick Mass. They were concerned about the altercation with Jeff Bodine. And it was, the situation is such that they feel their car is right and they're going to coast for a little while. 
Danny Sullivan coasts out of the pit area. He is back in the race. Remember, the side window on his car blew out early in the race. He has it repaired. He is five laps down as he falls in line to take the green flag and about a half a lap to restart this event. Some of the spotters around the racetrack as they observe the cars going through the corner are saying right now that Jeff Gordon seems to have the best handling car of all the cars on the racetrack. Jeff Gordon is ahead of Jeff Bodine and Rick Mast as we anticipate a green flag coming out on board Bill Elliott's car looking back on Bobby Labonte. There's part of the 300 plus thousand fans who were lucky enough to get a seat for the Brickyard 400. They had about three times as many requests for tickets as they were able to give out. Now the pace car has pulled off of the racetrack and Jeff Gordon leads them down. This is the 10th race that Jeff Gordon has led in 1994. He has led 274 miles in 1994 coming into this event. And track position, Bob, is so important. All these cars really and truly should have pitted because they've run 10, 12 laps, but they did not want to give up that track position. Saw Wally Dallenbach and Michael Waltrip go to the inside to try to pick up position. Dallenbach in the 43 car owned by Richard Petty and Michael Waltrip in the yellow number 30 machine. And that's Hutz Trickland right behind Wally Dallenbach. Pretty much a single file formation. One other question concerned drafting would they be able to draft? And I think it's pretty obvious that they are. Here's Michael Waltrip's roof cam as he negotiates turn three, moves it out onto the short straightaway, and now into turn number four. Michael's running in 15th spot. Trying to chase down Morgan Shepard, the sit go forward. Still trying to get by Strickland, pulls out but can't make the pass. Strickland trying to pick up the position on Wally Dallenbach, whose father, of course, raced here in the Indianapolis 500 many times. To show you the running order after 16 laps, Jeff Gordon continuing to set the, play, the pace. Mark Martin has moved back to 12 spot. Petty's moving forward, started about 36th up to 23rd already. There you see that Dale Earnhardt has fallen all the way back to 34th position after he had an encounter with Rick Mast in turn one and an encounter with the wall in turn four on the very first lap. Ricky There's Rudd. Ernie Irvin up on, on the back bumper of Rusty Wallace. Ricky Rudd leading this group of five through turn number two. Right behind him is Brett Bodine and Sterling Marlin, the Daytona 500 winner. Rusty Wallace and Ernie Irvin. And it looks like the draft is working on these cars. Otherwise, Ernie Irvin would be able to pull out and maybe pass Rusty Wallace. But all these cars hooked up in a line, he's not able to gain anything down the straightaway. Gordon continues to lead. Jeff Bodine is second. There's a little bit of racetrack then back there to third. And here comes Brett Bodine to the inside of Ricky Rudd. Didn't take Rudd long to move over and cover that spot. Bodine moves up to sixth position. Now here's Sterling Marlin trying to get to the inside of Rudd in turn two. They run through there side by side. Well, I tell you what, right now these drivers are being a little bit careful. But as the race wears on, we're going to have drivers drive in there and touch that other fellow in the left rear. There you see the skid marks left from Jimmy Spencer's car. Budweiser Blimp giving you the overhead perspective of 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th here in the early going of the Brickyard 400. See Jeff Bodine has just about caught Jeff Gordon. And a good battle for third here. Bill Elliott is trying to find his way around Rick Mast. And we ride now with Bill. 
the easy bill is turning the steering wheel. He's not really fighting that thing. That's a sign that his race car is handling very well. When he just gently moves the steering wheel back and forth. Casey, we love you, indicates a no to uh, Casey Elliott, who has been diagnosed with cancer but is doing fine, and we certainly wish him the best as Elliott has gotten around, picked up the spot. That's Bill Elliott's nephew, Ernie's son. So Elliott now moves into third position as Rick Mass, the pole sitter of this event, has fallen to fourth. Good battle back there for position. That's for 13th spot. And we'll pick up the telemetry on Michael Waltrip. All right, the miles per hour is on the left side on this one. Remember, on Bill Elliott's car was on the right. On the left is the miles per hour. On the right, the RPMs. This is down the back straight, 196 miles an hour. Wow. And that's going into a headwind. Didn't quite reach the 200 mile an hour mark that we saw earlier. And once again, just like Bill Elliott, Michael Walker just applying a little break as he goes in turn four. All right, Benny, with 20 laps completed, what's your, what's your overall perspective of what's happened so far? I think that everything is going about the way everyone envisioned. Get in line, see what the car is doing. Don't make any stupid mistakes at this stage of the race. If you're going to make a stupid mistake, at least wait till sometime later on when you're trying to win the race or trying to pass for position. We saw Greg Sachs get the left side wheels down under the white line. Those are the famous rumble strips. They upset an Indy car, but they don't have nearly as much effect on these heavier stock cars. Ernie Irving told me that go right there in the number 28 Haviland car, you cannot even feel those rumble strips in a stock car. Have we seen as much passing as you thought we would? Yes. I, I think we've seen quite a bit of passing. Here, Mark Martin. Looks like his car has got going forward. He's passed Dale Jarrett, Ricky Rudd. Closed up on the back bump of Ernie Irvin. Man, look at that line of cars. They are lined up in single file. Sterling Marlin leading Rusty Wallace into the first turn. Seventh, eighth, and ninth, and tenth right there. event fourth in the point standings as we go back up to the front and see that Jeff Gordon continues to hold on to the lead over Jeff Bodine. As far as the tire story is concerned, Goodyear is with Jeff Gordon, Hoosier on Jeff Bodine, the third place car of Bill Elliott is on Hoosiers, and the fourth place car of Rick Mast is on Hoosiers. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, Bob, you heard Jerry Punch tell you that the leader, Jeff Gordon, was concerned with a little bit of a push. We talked to Ray Evernham just a minute ago. He said the racetrack is coming to Jeff Gordon, and the push is beginning to go away. They do not anticipate making any changes to the car when they come in for their pit stop on lap 32. Well, Jeff Gordon did not practice that last practice in the afternoon. He probably would have discovered that he had a little push in his car, but they felt like that there's a lot of cars out there. They might take a chance on wrecking the race car. They sent out that last hour of practice. You know, each of the 43 starters who began today's race had hoped to become the Ray Haroon of stock car racing here at Indianapolis by being the first winner, but nobody wanted to be the Arthur Griner. And he was the guy who finished last in the first Indianapolis 500 back in 1911. And I think we can give that distinction to Jimmy Spencer, who is being shown as officially out of the race after his contact with the wall in turn three. As we watch the fight for the lead, let me tell you, Earnhardt fans, that he is running, currently running 27th as Jeff Bodine passes Jeff Gordon, takes the lead. This is the 11th race in 1994 that Jeff Bodine has led. The last time he led was at Pocono, where he led 156 of the 200 laps in his domination of that second race at the Pocono two and a half miles. 
Jeff Bodine from Chemung, New York, has taken over the lead from Jeff Gordon and has become our third leader of the day in the first 24 laps of the 160 lap event. One of our spotters told me Jeff Gordon has called his crew and said, now his car's a little bit loose. Jeff Bodine, Jeff Gordon, Bill Elliott, Rick Mast, and Brett Bodine are the top five after 24 laps in the Brickyard 400. We'll be right back. Oh, good, okay. A, J, A, J. Yep. Sorry about that, Kenny. <laughs> Is Elliot gaining on those guys? Looks like he might be. Yep. Well, Floyd is certainly good. Uh, I don't know. Earnhardt doesn't seem to be moving up very much, although he is up to 25th. But Tom Bodine's been running up. One. Okay. Say what, old Sterling Marlin running pretty good. Boy, that was a good race. Woo. Todd Bodine's moving up, too. Is he? Yeah. On both Wallace and Irvin, who are now in top 13. 10, if you, if you hit that battle. I've got a great problem-solving log here on Jeff Bodine's pitch. Okay? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. the Brickyard 400, 27 laps completed. Jeff Bodine sets the pace ahead of Jeff Gordon, Bill Elliott, Brett Bodine, and Sterling Marlin. And there is A.J. Foyt, who is currently being shown in the 33rd position. Boy, A.J. sweated out some anxious moments late yesterday afternoon in the qualifying. He was the 40th fastest, and there were several that took a shot at him, but nobody could go faster than A.J., and so he made the Brickyard 400, although he is coming out of retirement to do so. Well, he said he only officially retired from IndyCar racing, and so this isn't really coming out of retirement. When I took a lap around the racetrack before the race today, Bob, I saw a sign down in turn one and said, Welcome to Ford's house. <laughs> now some good battles going on back here. Brett Bodine leads Sterling Marlin down the straightaway. Rusty Wallace is right there, and Ernie Irvin is moving to the inside of Bobby Labonte. And we saw Rick Master pole center at the very end of that line of cars. So Rick Mast has fallen back here in the past few laps. He is now back to ninth position after leading initially. Jerry Punch is with Dr. Henry Bach, the director of medical services here. Report on Jimmy Spencer. Hank, you just checked Jimmy out. What's the status? Uh, Jimmy came in here walking, uh, looking pretty good. He was complaining of some pain in his right shoulder blade area. Had a lot of bruising back there, some around his right neck. I suspect he may have had some injury down to his right shoulder blade. So you, will you send him down for further x-rays? Right away now, Jerry. So uh, Jimmy Spencer going down to Methodist Hospital for x-rays. And we might remind you that Jimmy Spencer broke his right scapula or shoulder blade early in the year in a practice incident at a short track in Western North Carolina, practicing his fourth Thunderbird back in March of this year. So it's the same shoulder. They're going to send him down and get an x-ray. We'll try to get a report as soon as possible. All right, thank you, Jerry. Jeff Bodine leads here over Jeff Gordon. And Gordon's crew is telling him to just stay in his rhythm and run his own race. And he is staying within sight of the leader, Jeff Bodine. 
Can you imagine 23 year old, 23 year old Jeff Gordon running right behind Jeff O'Don, the leader, and led the Brickyard 400 at 23? Well, uh, and I know the fans gathered here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway were going crazy when Jeff was in the lead because he is a hometown favorite. He, of course, was born in California. But some rules out there didn't allow a race driver to race as young as Jeff wanted to start. And so he came to Indiana to run with various organizations, including the United States Auto Club, picking up two championships with USAC before deciding to go to the Stock Car Wars. Here's Jack Aroot with a report on Jeff Bodine. Well, Bob, when Jeff Bodine first started racing in New England in Modifieds, he owned his own race cars. He owns his own Winston Cup car now, and he has devised a problem-solving log that is posted on the pit wall here. You'll notice that it says that you should take care of your own problems afterwards, but look at how he breaks it out. If the jack breaks, they have what the situation and the remedy should be, all the way down if the spoiler needs adjusting, if there's a problem under the hood, if the gas man falls, if the jack drops early, etc. all the way down here. But the one thing, Benny Parsons, that it doesn't have is what they should do if they win the race. I think down here it should say, go to victory lane. Believe me, Jack, there'll be about a million people trying to direct them to Victory Lane. <laughs> and, Jack, we've got some pit stops already started at lap 30. Brett Bodine running in fourth position but receiving a challenge here from Sterling Marlin. And right behind are Rusty Wallace and Ernie Irvin. Brett Bodine, of course, drives for drag racer Kenny Bernstein and has already announced that he will not be back with this team next year, but certainly Brett Bodine would like to give Kenny a win before the two separate at the end of the season. And Kenny Bernstein has raced here at the Indianapolis 500 many, many times. With an IndyCar right, Roberto with Guerrero, of course, a track record holder here. Here are the two front cars, Bodine and Gordon, and we anticipate more pit stops here before long. Say what, it won't be long as Michael Waltrip makes the pit stop right in front of us. Won't be long before these fellows will be coming in. 32 laps have been completed. Let's see if they'll make a pit stop this time. Looks like Gordon is going to. Yep, Bodine stays out, but Jeff Gordon is bringing the car in. Jack Aroot will be there to call the pit stop, Jack. Well, Bob, they radioed in, Jeff Gordon did, that he'd like the car tightened up just a little bit, so it seems they've gone from a push to a loose condition. Michael Walter completes his action. Remember, they've come down pit road at 65 miles an hour or under. The crew remains on the driver's left side of the wall. They come across as he hits the second to first stall, and now they go to work. They will change all four tires. It looks to be a normal stop. We'll see if they make any adjustments on the wedge. So far, we have not discerned any, and it seems to be a nominal stop as Rick Mass also comes in to make his pit stop. This is so very important, as you know, gentlemen, the first stop, because this is the first issue of the Black Book, the first entry that they can make under racing conditions. Gordon is away at 24.6 seconds. Meanwhile, they're also going to work. They've just about completed their work on Rick Mass Machine. And here's our leader, Jeff Bodine, coming down pit road to make his pit stop. Wallace. Benny, not a real good pit stop for Jeff Gordon. He had some problems there on the left front. They did put one round of wedge in the car, but they did have a problem with the jack. It wasn't jacked high enough on the left side. Here's Jack Aroot to call Bodine's pit stop. Well, Bob, Jeff Bodine may have a problem. He radioed in that he's feeling a vibration. Now, these cars run with, these cars run with inner liners, so it could have been, as they say, a tire equalizing and causing that vibration. The cars look awfully slow coming down pit road, but that is because instead of a 100 mile an hour speed limit for Indy cars, these cars use a 65 mile an hour speed limit. 22.4 seconds for that stop on Jeff Bodine. Ernie Irvin has completed service on his car. Rusty Wallace rolls out of the pit area. Brent Bodine has completed service. So has Mark Martin. And Bill Elliott now is on pit road. He's the leader of the race. He picked up the lead for just a moment. Jerry Punch, he's headed toward you. 
at 55 miles per hour. The 38-year-old eight-time most popular driver, Elliott, will come in. They will likewise change four tires and try to tighten his Ford up just a, a little bit. Mike Beam and the crew now go to work. Right side tires going on. We thought they may be able to change just two only, but it's enough. Tires are too important here. First can of fuel in. Junior Johnson handing a tire over the wall. Left side tires now coming off. Fresh Goodyear rubber going on. Jack beneath the car. They get it full of fuel. Blood cuts are on. And he is down and away at 19.3 seconds. Good stop for the Budweiser crew. Yes, indeed. Elliott with a good pit stop. Of course, the cars enter the racetrack on these acceleration lanes. So Bill Elliott working back up to speed after completing his first pit stop. Now Todd Bodine in car 75 coming in the pits here, picked up the lead for the moment, but now he relinquishes it to come in for his pit stop. Todd Bodine, who ran so well in the Daytona 500 and has run several good races this year, is in the pit stops in the pits for service on and the jack down on that car and the jack fell on that car slowed him down probably five seconds bob this is going to be a very slow pit stop for todd bodine they're just now getting over to the left side of the car and getting it jacked up you can see the clock ticking up in the left the right hand corner of your screen and once again he can't get the jack up high enough look 30 seconds and finally, at 33.8 seconds, Todd Bodine rolls back out. The 77 car of Greg Sachs is now the leader of the Brickyard 400, but pit stops are being made. You're watching live coverage of the inaugural Brickyard 400 live on ABC Sports, and we'll be back with more after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Something's wrong with the seven car. Ready. Something's wrong with the seven car. Yep. I think now he's in turn two. Bill Elliott, didn't Bill Elliott pass him? I don't know, he seems to be running okay to me. He's staying ahead of Gordon. Okay, maybe, uh, look. yeah, he's all right. Looks like, it looks to me like that uh, Gordon's a lot faster than he is right now. Anyway. Correct. Tell the guys upstairs. Paul Andrews says no problem on Bodine. Good, thank you. Twenty-three pit. a lap down, no. Right. Of all the cars that pitted, of all the cars that pitted, Bill Elliott is in front of the cars that have that pitted. That's correct. Yeah. That He's the real tomorrow. leader of the race when everybody pits. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, it's confusing. Right. And now here comes Dale. Bernard's pit. He's going to pit this time by. Yep, he's coming. Sixteen's going in turn one. There he comes, being passed. <laughs> Does that mean Burton is... Uh... Yes, 40, 
three laps. Welcome back to the Brickyard 400 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. 40 laps, 100 miles have been completed in this event. And at the moment, the number 16 car of Ted Musgrave is the leader of the race. Now, he has not pitted, and several others have not. Well, they pitted earlier at lap 13 on that caution flag. They made their pit stop then, so they can go 13 laps farther than the other guys. So they'll be making a pit stop in about 10 laps. Jeff Burton is leading this trio down the front straightaway, and that's Todd Rodine right behind. We documented his pit stop a few laps ago. And I think that Dale Earnhardt led the race at the 100-mile mark. Earnhardt, remember, he stopped on lap 13. He had passed that bus rate and was leading the race. We will document that for you in just a few moments. Check that out, but you could very well be right. He did pick up the lead there for a moment, but has since made the pit stop. Currently, we have 32 cars that are still on the lead lap, and Ted Musgrave is showing the way. Of the cars that made that pit, series of pit stops in our last sequence, Phil Elliott is leading those cars, and Jeff Gordon is second, Jeff Bodine is third, and there goes our leader, Musgrave, heading toward the pits. Musgrave bringing the Family Channel Ford in for a pit stop. This is one of two cars from the Jack Roush stable. He's teammates with Mark Martin, and the crew goes to work on the right side. I, guess, I said that Dale Earnhardt had led the race at the 100-mile mark. I guess NASCAR is giving credit to Ted Musgrave being the leader at the 100-mile mark. Work still going on on the left side of the car. Pretty good pit stop for Ted Musgrave as he moves back out onto the racetrack. And now the lead is picked up by Lake Speed, who had to take a provisional starting spot to get into the field. He did not qualify fast enough, but he did get in on a provisional and came from 41st. And once again, this is another car that stopped on lap 13 to make his pit stop. And there is your summary after 100 miles, 40 laps. Ted Musgrave is the leader. The average speed of the Lover, or rather almost 134 miles an hour. We've had seven leaders and six lead changes. Two caution flags for a, a total of six laps. And one car, that being Jimmy Spencer, officially listed as out of the race. And guess who's running second right now? Bob Wright, oh, right behind Lake Speed. Looks like that uh, A.J. Foyt might fall into that category. Lake Speed leads and running second at the moment is A.J. Foyt. There he comes out of turn number two. Here's our host for the afternoon, Paul Page. All right, Bob. Now, everybody grab a three-by-five card. It's time for the Budweiser Pace Car Sweepstakes. The 100-mile leader was Ted Musgrave. So write down Ted Musgrave on your three-by-five card and you could win one of four 1995 Chevrolet Monte Carlos, the official pace car of the Brickyard 400. And be sure to stay tuned for the 200-mile leader for your second chance to win. Brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. All right, Paul, Ted Musgrave was the leader at the 100-mile mark, but he has made the pit stop and therefore falls back into the searing, scoring serial back to 31st position. There is A.J. Foyt, who is in second position at the moment, and right behind him is third place, Harry Gant. There goes Harry Gant. Boy, you know that Harry has to be thrilled about making this event because he is, of course, in his final season of NASCAR Winston Cup competition. He's already announced that he will retire at the end of the year. And, of course, we don't really know when or if A.J. Foyt will ever retire. No. A.J. Foyt started 40th. He's running second. Harry Gant, I mean, Harry Gant started 42nd. He's now running third. A.J. Foyt first came to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1958 wow. and was involved in the big crash over in turn number three. And when he got out of the car after that day, he said he didn't know whether he really wanted to be in this business after getting through that crash. But, of course, he participated in 35 consecutive Indianapolis 500s. And as I indicated, was very happy to be part of this inaugural Brickyard 400 NASCAR Winston Cup race. He's in second position. The leader is Lake Speed after 45 of 160 laps. We'll be back with more after these messages.
What's the helicopter leaving for, you reckon? Could be taking Jimmy down there. Or could be flying the governor out or... Okay, all right. Okay. A blimp pop. Blimp, blimp. Thank you. Whoops. All right. He's out of fuel? Yeah, he sure is. I bet he's out of fuel. <laughs> he's got a long way to go, too. That's in turn two. Is it really? Yep. Yeah. Well, if you can't win, do something to get yourself on the air, AJ. See, there again, that's, you just can't stretch it. Speeds in the bits, the leader. That's Jeff Hensley and the crew. the overhead shots and there is A.J. Foyt who we think ran out of fuel because he slowed dramatically in turn number two. Here's Gary Gerald. Well we believe that's the case as well. The crew immediately going to work to service the car but he came in dead stick. There was no power. They're going to get the ether now to spray underneath the uh, vent up on top. It's sometimes difficult to get started. There's a couple of squirts as they work on the left side tires. Foyt, of course, has had such great success over so many years here for the first time in a stock car. Now he fires the engine. They still haven't completed the left side change. So a man who gave his many fans such a thrill to get up with the front runners on that exchange of pit stops down off the Jackson now rolling. And Jeff Gordon picks up the lead once again. A.J. Foyt's fastest lap in a front-engine car before this weekend was 154.6, a speed turned in during qualifying for the 1964 Indianapolis 500. He qualified for today's race at 168 and a half. And A.J. Foyt pulls back out onto the racetrack. I tell you what, you just can't stretch these fuel stops. As you said, he ran out of fuel coming off the second corner. Budweiser's aerial ambassador, the Bud One Airship, is providing the beauty shots of the Indianapolis and the Indianapolis Motor Speedway for our live ABC coverage of the Brickyard 400. So Jeff Gordon continues to lead this race. Now we have seen all of those drivers who pitted early come in for their stop, and so we revert back to Jeff Gordon, Jeff Gordon as the leader. Jeff Bodine is running in second position, and Jeff Brabham is into the pits. Wow. This must be an unscheduled stop because they went to the left side. Jeff Brabham driving a car owned by Michael Cranibus and Carl Haas. 
Michael Kratifus, a former director of special vehicle operations for Ford, and Carl Haas, of course, an IndyCar owner, putting together their knowledge into this NASCAR Winston Cup effort that has performed very well under Jeff Brabham in the Brickyard 400. A good battle here for second position as Jeff Bodine is just ahead of Bill Elliott with whom we ride. Yes, we're inside with Bill Elliott, and still he's not fighting that steering wheel, just smoothly turning the wheel as he comes off the second corner. A couple of Fords, Jeff Bodine has a Ford, Bill Elliott has a Ford, but Jeff Gordon has the Chevrolet in front. Check your local listings for the game in your area. That's tonight here on ABC Sports. And you better watch all the baseball you can because <laughs> next week they go on enough. strike. <laughs> we have already had 10 different leaders in today's event. The record this year for most leaders in a race was 13 at Daytona. So we're on a record-setting pace for most leaders in the event this year. Bill Elliott now having to carry the Junior Johnson colors because his teammate, Jimmy Spencer, is out of the race after crashing in turn number three. Gary Gerald has a report on the fuel situation. Gary? Well, Bob, I think one of the uncertainties, one of the questions that was posed before the start of the race may be answered. We said if you could squeeze out 40 laps, 100 miles, you could conceivably make this a three-stop race. Well, we saw the flurry of cars that came in on the early yellow at lap 13. In our quick survey, we have not found a team that was able to make it 100 miles. So it doesn't look like anybody's going to have an advantage in a one less pit stop, as we may have speculated at the start of the show. Harry Ginn, I think, in the 33 car went further than anyone else. He might be able to go 100 miles, but I'd be awfully close. We're watching fourth and fifth position here. The 26 car driven by Brett Bodine and the number two machine handled by Rusty Wallace. Just ahead, a couple of lap cars, Bobby Hamilton and Joe Nemechek. Brett Bodine, one of three Bodine brothers in the race today. And of course, there were three brothers that competed here in Indianapolis in the 500 back in 1982, the Whittington brothers. Rusty Wallace in fifth position. Once again, this is cars owned by Roger Penske. Fellows who, how many 500s has Penske won here at Indianapolis? He's won 10 Indianapolis 500 mile wow. races, believe it or not. An incredible record. That's Bobby Hamilton and Joe Nemechek in front of these fellows. That's Hamilton in the black number 40, Nemechek in the 41. And they're running 32nd and 33rd, a lap down. And now Bodine moves to the inside of Nemechek and passes him. And now Rusty Wallace goes to the inside and gets around Nemechek. And so this battle for position between Bodine and Wallace is continuing. And Brett Bodine pulls up on the inside of Bobby Hamilton. 105 laps to go in the inaugural Brickyard 400 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. The leader is Jeff Gordon. We'll be back in just a moment. Here's some Phil, uh, Tanya Tucker's down in Bodine's pit. Tanya Tucker is in Bodine's pit if you're looking for some fill. Okay.
<laughs> okay. Seven out of 160 laps completed in the inaugural Brickyard 400. Jeff Gordon is shown as the leader. Jeff Bodine runs in second position. Bill Elliott is in third. Brett Bodine, fourth. And in fifth position is Rusty Wallace. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, Bob, Jeff Bodine is a very special crew member this afternoon. Tanya Tucker, country and western star, and you're here in the pits enjoying yourself. I'm having a great time. I mean, Jeff Bodine is the reason I'm here, um, because he's, he's the one who's got me into NASCAR. What was that conversation like when he first tried to entice you to come to NASCAR? What did Jeff tell you? Well, uh, actually, Jeff was a, a big fan of mine, and he brought his whole racing team to see me at Dollywood. Uh, for about three days. We became very good friends. And I guess when you have a friend that does something uh, so wonderful as race cars, hey, I get into it. And it's really special that I can be here today and watch him race. Well, Paul, she's really enjoying it. And Bob and Benny, it's the most important thing for her right now is to get back watching the action and see if her man can win the race. Well, there's lots of action on the racetrack, and the best battle out there actually involves Jeff Bodine as he tries to hold off Bill Elliott, who is still right there behind him. Jeff Bodine, every time he's looked in the rearview mirror today, he's seen someone. First it was Jeff Gordon, and now it's Bill Elliott. been a long time since regular visitors to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway heard the drivers get on and off of the accelerator. In an Indy car, you're flat out all the way around, but as we heard when we were riding with Bill there just a second ago, you got to back off and hit the brake going into the corners in these stock cars. And going to all four corners, you back off and hit the brakes. Let's check in with Jerry Punch, who has a report on Bill Elliott. When Bill Elliott pit a little while ago, he had complained that the car was starting to get just a little bit loose. They tightened the car up, and apparently they have gone way too tight. Bill's having a trouble with a push in the corners. He runs fine when he's behind another car, but when he gets in front of a car, it gets even worse. So he said he's going to have to buy this time. They should pit in another eight or nine laps, and they will adjust back from where they made the car so tight on the first pit stop. Up. So Bill is staying as close as he can behind Bodine because it helps the car handle better. But you really can't tell that Bill Elliott, by watching his hands on the steering wheel, Bob, you really can't tell he's having a problem because still he isn't really fighting the car. You see as he turns. You see he's never keeping that wheel all the way to the left. If he kept it all the way over there, so you would know that he had a pushing problem. But every once in a while, he goes back to the right like he's trying to catch the back end. There we see, off the gas, on the brakes, back on the accelerator, across the short chute. And once again, off the gas, on the brake the rumble strips. Oh, see, almost lost at that time. A little bit of a correction there. Here is Ernie, uh, rather, uh, Ernie Irvin and Mark Martin as they are in the fifth and sixth positions. By the way, the average speed at the end of 60 laps, 142.154. Two cautions have slowed the pace so far. One for debris on the racetrack and the other for the incident involving Jimmy Spencer. And now Mark Martin moves to the inside of Ernie Irvin at the end of the back stretch, and he goes in the sixth. 
see Sterling Marlin. He is the eighth place car. Mark is in sixth. Ernie is in seventh. And Sterling Marlin is now in eighth spot. Mark Martin took the bus tour here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway when he visited in 1979. And he said at that time, no, we'll never race here. He used to live up in North Liberty, Indiana, which is up in the northern part of the state. Has been involved in uh, stock car racing for many years. And now fulfilling, I'm sure, a dream of his to get to compete at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And we can see when Ernie Irvin pulled right behind Mark Martin, he's able to loosen that six car up a little bit. We saw the six, the back of the six car wiggle when he got in the corner. That's because the 28 is right behind him. Mark Martin running in sixth position, Ernie Irvin in seventh, and Sterling Marlin here in eighth spot. Given that car a pretty good run. We understand that the 26 car of Brett Bodine may be losing some fluid. He is running in the fifth position, so we'll keep an eye on that for you as we ma watch Mark Martin and Ernie Irvin. There goes Jim Purvis and Sterling Marlin. That's Jeff Purvis in the yellow and red car, the country time. Mark Martin pulled over trying to get a little draft off Purvis down the straightaway. Purvis pulls over to the inside of the track to give the faster cars a lot of room. Purvis is running in 31st position. He is one lap down to the field. Jeff Gordon continues to lead here in the inaugural Brickyard 400. We'll be back with more from the inaugural running of this race after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. has moved up to fourth and he had the fastest pit stop that we saw in the first round at 17 seconds. I think their second stop could be critical to advancing them by uh, Challenge Elliott. Well, Elliott fell back. He must have taken his pit stop. Oh, there he is. Kyle Petty got some heavy damage to the right rear of his car. Six and 28. Right. Mark's coming in. Once again, green flag pit stop. Service on the left side of the car now. We saw them put one round of wedge in the car, and the right rear tire rolled all the way across pit road. Finally, one of his crew runs over, gets the tire. As others come down, Rich Bickle making a pit stop, so is Jeff Purvis, and that car isn't moving very No, far. it's not something wrong at all. He's not getting the car going, now he's up to speed. So 
but the car finally gets up to speed on the racetrack. The best battle is for fourth position. Rusty Wallace is in fourth, and right behind him in fifth spot is Brett Bodine. And they'll be making pit stops pretty soon. By the way, Dale Earnhardt right now is in tenth spot. He's out of sequence with these cars in his pit stops. Kyle Petty made a pit stop just a moment ago. He's back in 32nd spot, a lap down. But once again, he is pitting before these cars. Rick Mast has made a pit stop, we will tell you. Here is both Rusty Wallace and Brett Bodine making a pit stop. And the second and third place cars of Jeff Bodine and Bill Elliott are also in. Here comes Rusty Wallace now. Keeping the car under 55 miles an hour as he comes up to his assigned pit area and the crew goes to work. Bill Elliott is in. His team switching to the left side of that car to get the tires on. Cleaning the grill. Elliott is back underway. Rusty Wallace has finished with his pit stop. We see Jeff Bodine just leaving the pit, so he was still able to maintain that position in front of Bill Elliott. There's Jeff, rather a Brett Bodine coming out. We anticipate a pit stop by our leader, Jeff Gordon, momentarily. As Bodine works back up to speed. In the warm-up lane in turn two. Tell you that Ernie Irvin's on the pit. Ernie Irvin is in for a pit stop. You saw Dale Jarrett pull in and pull in just ahead of him. Robert Yates through, and here's the leader, Jeff Gordon, coming off the racetrack and down pit road. Jeff has to be careful not to break the speed limit of 55 miles per hour. And Jack Aroot is in Jeff Gordon's pit. Here he comes. Well, Bob, so far, Jeff Gordon has decided to try and run as conservative a race as possible. It's hard to believe when you see the speed that he's setting. But they are going to go ahead and just change four tires. Still, no chassis adjustments on the car. Now, the pit stall directly in front of Jeff Gordon belonged to the pole sitter, Rick Mass. During his pit stop, during pit stop here, they had a problem as Gordon goes away. During the pit stop for Rick Mass, he encountered some problems. The car did not fire, but they finally got it fired, but it has dropped him way back in the standings under these green flag conditions. Did you see the tire mark on Jeff Gordon's car? The 24 on the left side? He's definitely had contact with someone. Here, maybe we can tell what happened. That is Jeff Bodine to his inside. Jeff Bodine is trying to get by him, and Jeff Gordon is trying to go to the pits, and they make contact. This wow! Was out of turn four, Jeff was trying to get to the pits and uh, had made some contact there with Jeff Bodine. Man, I tell you what, we saw the, the fella change in the left front tire. Look at the fender, and I don't know if it was rubbing the tire or not. And look, the left front is flat. Look how close the front of the car is to the ground. Dale Earnhardt comes in. He gives up fourth position to make a green flag pit stop. Earnhardt has had problems since the very first lap, but trying to fight his way back up into contention. The Richard Childress crew waits on Dale. Now, because he is the series champion, he gets first pick on where he wants his pit to be. And of course, he chose the far south end of the racetrack down by turn one. like the car is full of fuel. As soon as the tires are on, he'll be away. Good stop at 19.7 seconds for Dale Earnhardt. The lead is now held by Greg Sachs. Here he is running in a bunch of cars off the fourth turn. That's he in the white car right in the middle. Dave Marcus, the yellow car in front. Jack Aroon has a report on Jeff Gordon. How's the car? Well, the report is, gentlemen, that there are no problems with the car. 
There was some question as to whether maybe he had the left front go down in that little set to with Jeff Lodine, but talking to Ray Evernham, he said everything's okay, but he did say, hey, we dodged a bullet. Well, they sure did because there was a pretty significant contact between him and Jeff. Oh, I'm telling you, there was. So for the second time this afternoon, Greg Sachs takes over the lead of the race. And it looks like that Mark Martin's car is slow. The family Ford is slow coming off the corner. And Greg is pitting. And now we see Mark Martin pull over to the inside as our leader, Greg Sachs, takes the U.S. Air Ford to pit road. Notice how he had to get on the brakes and slow down considerably from the speed he was at on the racetrack to stay under the speed limit. Now that puts Jeff Gordon back into the lead. Greg arriving at his pit area. They go to work on the right side. And Bill Elliott comes in the pits with an unscheduled pit stop as we're watching Greg Sachs. Here's Bill once again. This is the second time in three or four laps that he's been in. Well, I don't think they got the left front tight when he was in the pits the last time. And rather be safe than sorry, they came back in and changed that left front again. Good, Bobby. Jerry Punch was down there when Bill came in. Is that indeed what happened, Jerry? Well, let's check with the crew chief, Mike B. Mike, an unscheduled stop. What, what happened? He said he thought he had a, said he thought he had a vibration, so I kind of gambled there just hoping it's the left side, you know. I didn't want to change the floor and get farther behind in here. And uh, we just, yeah, it's just our luck. They're kind of luck. The kind of year they have had with the two-year Johnson team can't afford to take a chance. A vibration at 200-plus miles an hour on these straightaways could be disastrous, guys. Jack Arut has a report on Mark Martin. Well, we don't think we'll see Mark Martin win the Brickyard 400. Checking with Steve Meal, it seems that they just dropped the cylinder, gentlemen. So he's going to have to run at reduced speeds now for the remainder of this race. Well, it appears as if Jeff Gordon's car has not been all that much affected. There is the damage on the left side with his contact with Jeff Bodine, but it does not appear to be affecting the running of the car in any way. There are the 55 car of Jimmy Hensley goes a lap down to Jeff Gordon, also Wally Dallenbach. Wally Dallenbach driving for Richard Petty is shown now in 23rd position, and he is a lap down. There are 22 cars on the lead lap. Well, this place will erupt if Jeff Gordon wins the inaugural Brickyard 400. So many Central Indiana people are a real favorite of Jeff Gordon's, and they were very happy when he won his first NASCAR Winston Cup event at Charlotte Motor Speedway earlier this year on the same day as the Indianapolis 500. Stay with us for more live coverage of the Brickyard 400. Nearing halfway, five laps from the halfway mark. This is definitely a two-car race, isn't it? Hey, guys. Yes. Yeah, it was Mark Martin that dropped the cylinder. Yes. Okay, I thought you thought I said Jeff Gordon, and I was worried. No, no. Okay.
Okay. Okay. All right. That's for sure. <laughs> At the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and in the inaugural running of the Brickyard 400, the lead is held by Jeff Gordon with Jeff Bodine running second, Harry Gant third, Rusty Wallace in fourth position, and Ernie Irvin in fifth. More than 300,000 fans here. Well, we don't know exactly how many because the Speedway never tells us, but we assume somewhere a little over 300,000. By far the largest crowd that the NASCAR Winston Cup drivers have ever performed for, and probably the second largest crowd in motorsports uh, history next to the Indy 500. I tell you what, a huge, huge, lot of folks here. Look at that, people on both sides, right and left as they go down the front straightaway. Here's Kyle Petty. He is half a lap away from the halfway point. And a caution. And we have a caution. The yellow flag is waving by Doyle Ford, but it still will be the halfway point when he comes around. Petty is going to save that lap, and this is a huge break for Harry Kent. Remember, he is not pitted. He's in third place. And there our leader, Jeff Gordon, takes the caution flag, so a huge break for Harry Kent. Kent was running in third position, had not made the stop, so he will be able now to make his pit stop under the caution. Well, our host, Paul Page, has a report. Paul? Well, Bob, it's time again for the Budweiser Pace Car Sweepstakes. The 200-mile leader, as you saw, was Jeff Gordon. Now, write down Jeff Gordon on your 3x5 card, and you could win one of four 1995 Chevrolet Monte Carlo, official pace car of the Brickyard 400. Stay tuned for the 300-mile leader for your next chance to win. Brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. So we are under yellow. It is our third of the day here at Indianapolis. Again, a check of the race course. The only yellow involving contact with the wall was when Jimmy Spencer got into the wall and suffered some injury to his shoulder. They sent him off to Methodist Hospital so that they could x-ray and make sure he's okay. Now tomorrow on ABC, it's America's Funniest Hour. And then Clark's secret may be revealed on Lois and Clark. The New Adventures of Superman, then Richard Dreyfuss and Holly Hunter star in Steven Spielberg's Always, tomorrow night, here on ABC. So this giant crowd watches at the halfway point. And in front of the field, it is Jeff Gordon. Benny, you are just having one heck of a time, aren't you? I'm telling you. For the it's second time, ladies and gentlemen, Benny Parsons has upset a bottle of water. Oh, man. All over the place. Man. Second time in you half the race. You can't take me nowhere. <laughs> On Jeff Bodine, a problem with Jeff Bodine. The leader time What's a caution for? Do we know? We haven't officially heard. Exhaust pipe. Kenny Martin said. Debris, Okay. Okay. Okay.
race summary at the halfway point of the Brickyard 400 shows the lead was held by Jeff Gordon at average speed of 146.017. 10 liters and 12 lead changes. Three caution flags, total of seven laps, one car. Jimmy Spencer officially out of the race. And he is being x-rayed at Methodist Hospital for a possible shoulder injury. Lots of pit stops here in the last few minutes. Let's check in with Jack Aroot. Well, Bob, one of the things that you have never seen at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway before is a car coming off the racetrack, going to Gasoline Alley, and is gonna have parts replaced and go back out. Mark Martin, a clutch. Yeah, I rent the clutch trying to get it out of the pits. Uh, the concrete pits don't let you spin the tires like it does at most places where we're at. And uh, it had a real high first gear, and the only way I could get it to take off and not kill the engine was slip the clutch. Now, normally at the Indy 500, gentlemen, because it's only one race, they'd call it quits for the day, but you're in the hunt for the cup this year. Well, you know, we got to get back out. That's what we do. But uh, tell you what, we had an awful good race car out there in that Valvoline Thunderbird, and I'm, uh, I'm crushed. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. Gary? Jack, we frequently talk about how emotions swing in this crazy sport, and they've just taken a big swing for Harry Gant, Leo Jackson, Charlie Presley, and everybody on this team. You got the yellow. It put you back in sync. You were looking great, but then you had a problem on that pit stop. Tell us what happened. Yeah, we came in, made a, a great pit stop, you know, but uh, we let the car down before the uh, we got the uh, ratchet out, you know, making a weight adjustment. and. So, but we're we're in good shape. I think there's only I don't know. There's only about 20 cars lead left, so we're in good shape. So you came back in. You got rid of the ratchet now, and you're back out there. You lost some positions, obviously. Have you got enough muscle to run with the front runners? Were you able to find out before that last yellow? You know, I really don't know. I, uh, we're not uh, we're not as good as uh, you know as Jeff and and uh, some of those cars. No, we're not that good. But we're just hoping to you know to maybe try to get a top 10 finish. Are you enjoying Indianapolis? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. All right, let's go to Jerry Fudge. Well, Gary, second place competitor, Jeff Bodine, has complained that the throttle is sticking on the car. Now, when a throttle sticks at 200 miles per hour, that can be rather frightening. I'm with his engine builder, Danny Glad. Now, Danny, what exactly is the problem? Well, in these cars, the floorboard gets so hot and the sole of his foot gets so sticky that it doesn't work smoothly on accelerator pedal. Here is a real important place here, Loud, New Hampshire, any flat racetrack where you have to just squeeze into the throttle. If, the, if your foot gets jerky on the throttle, it's hard to drive the car. So we'll just give him some spray silicone. He'll spray the sole of his foot. He'll throw the cam back out. He'll be on his way and be able to work the throttle smooth again. So it's not the throttle. It's his foot that's stuck to the floorboard. They're going to spray it with some silicone. And, and why didn't he come in? Now, he actually came down pit road. No, he, he, he was at the front of the pack, and all the cars that needed to pit the first time were behind him, and we were talking talking fuel mileage strategy, and he just missed the pit road first time by. We decided not to come in because we'd lose track position and maybe take a chance of getting in a wreck or something like that, so we're going to wait now. It won't really hurt our fuel mileage. Everybody's going to make one more stop. We're just on a little bit older tires than everybody else, but we'll be all right. Well, by virtue of missing his pit, he remains our leader, Jeff Bodine, up front. Bob? All right, thank you, Jerry. We'll be back with more from the Brickyard 400 after this message and a word from our ABC station. <clears throat> Man. What are they doing down there to grab him's car? Taping it up? It looks like it. Well, we're going to see how strong that Jeff Gordon is now. Yes, we are. Point still in the lead lap. to go this time. Because he missed his pit. They was talking to, to the crew and missed his pit. Missed the end of pit road. Okay. Track was 
position? I don't know. five laps but you know Jeff Bodine guys just for your information and, and he's been out there 15 laps or 16 laps more than longer than anyone else. Welcome back to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and ABC's live coverage of the inaugural Rickyard 400 NASCAR Winston Cup race. Now there is Dale Earnhardt the number three machine he lost considerable track position all the way back to 19. I guess he had a little bit of a problem on his pit stop, Benny. And I think he went back in the pits to correct something. Here's, Here's the leaderboard, Jeff Bodine, Sterling Marlin, Jeff Gordon, Brett Bodine running fourth, and Rusty Wallace fifth, six through 10, Rudd, Urban, Elliott, Jarrett, and Speed. Here's Jack Aroot. Yeah, well, Bob, uh, Ray Hendrick, who's one of the, I mean, Rick Hendrick, who's one of the um, owners of the car that, uh, Jeff Gordon is driving, just radioed to his driver and said, what are you trying to do? Put on a great show, show yourself off in front of the hometown fans, and all Gordon did is say, 10-4. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are going to see, Benny, what he's got now, because he's back there in third position. He's got Marlin and uh, Bodine ahead of him, so we're going to see how strong that car is. Jeff Bodine, as I said, has got several laps on his tires. We'll see if he can stay in front of Sterling Marlin, but... Here's Jerry Punch. Jerry, what was the problem on Earnhardt's pit stop? Well, let's grab Richard Childers. Richard, why the two pit stops? Well, you know, our tape was blowing off the front of the car and, you know, it was picking up a little push, so we put the tape back on it and tried to do a little adjustment, sir. So nothing major? Nothing major. Well, uh, just priming himself for the second half of this event, the second half run. Bob? Green flag drops and we're back to racing. With Bodine leading him into turn number one. The inside cars are those not on the lead lap. We see A.J. Foyt, the black car on the inside, being overtaken by Brett Bodine and Rusty Wallace. He's three laps down in 39th position, A.J. Foyt is. Gary Gerald, we understand that Foyt had a problem in the pits. Indeed he did. The car came off the jack, Bob, and one of the crewmen, B.S. Hilton, suffered an injury to his right arm, and the safety crew was here. They've taken him in for treatment now, but it was a costly stop for Foyt as the car came down off the jack. It turned out to be costly for the crew member as well. Not a serious injury, we believe. Let's hope that uh, the injury was not serious. Riding with Bill Elliott there for the moment, and now we see Jeff Gordon go to the inside of Sterling Marlin and grab second. So we found out that Jeff Gordon can pass Sterling Marlin with ease, and I'm impressed with Jeff Bodine being able to pull away from these guards this much with an extra 15, 16 laps on his tires. He is on the Hoosier tires, don't forget, whereas Jeff Gordon is on the Goodyears. Brett Bodine overtaking Bobby Hillen, going in the corner. Brett Bodine is having a great race. Now we're going to replay Dale Earnhardt's pit stop, or rather, yeah, Dale Earnhardt's pit stop. Richard Childers talked about coming in the pits. We see him going to the left front. Also, going around to the right front, putting some tape on the car. That helps the car, the downforce on the front of the car, helps the car glue to the racetrack a little bit better. The 44 car driven by Bobby Hillen is not on the lead lap. He is 22nd a lap down. Rusty Wallace and Ernie Irvin both go to the inside and pass him in the second corner. As you can see, Rusty Wallace is running in fifth position at the moment. Ernie Irvin is sixth and Bill Elliott in seventh. We see Lake Speed back in 10th spot. We talked about what a break it was for Harry Gant. Lake Speed, another car who caught a huge break on that last caution play. 
Wallace, when he came here to test for the Brickyard 400, brought four cars and nine engines just to find out which one would run better here at the Speedway. John Andretti, who is two laps down, along with Jeff Brabham. Brabham also came in and got some tape on his car a few laps ago. A.J. Boyd is three laps down, running in 39th position. Mark Martin, we've already talked to. His car is back in the pit area, getting a clutch replaced. Danny Sullivan, Indy 500 veteran, is eight laps down in 42nd. And Jimmy Spencer is shown as the only car officially out of the race at this point, having crashed early on. We see Brett Bodine has caught Sterling Marlin. Brett is having a great run, Benny. He is having a terrific run today in that Quaker State Ford. Of course, the Kenny Bernstein team was very happy when their IndyCar effort produced a winner in the Michigan 500. And Jeff Gordon has caught Jeff Bodine. And we watch from the blimp this battle for the lead as Gordon comes in on Jeff Bodine. See if he can make the pass here on the backstretch. Like Jeff Bodine really does want him to pass. Now uh -oh. Gordon goes to the inside but cannot make the move in turn three. It's like Jeff Gordon catches it right at the end of the straightaway but not able to get alongside enough to make the pass. Try it again. Nope. This doesn't have the momentum to get by him. And you can see that Jeff Gordon is trying. The rear of the car wiggled just a bit as he came off turn one. Does he want to take the lead at this point, Benny? Oh, yes. He wants to lead this thing. Any race car driver wants to lead if he has a car that's capable of it. Ten drivers have led so far in this race today. We understand that Jeff Bodine is scheduled to pit in about 13 laps, Benny, somewhere around there. Boy, he's going to be really out of sequence with the rest of the cars. He really is. Unless there's a caution between now and then, he'll be way off sequence. Now, if all these cars have to stop once, it, have to stop twice before the end of the races comes around, that will not be too bad for Jeff Bodine. But if he has to stop twice and the rest of them once, he's got a huge problem. While we watch this battle for the lead, you know this isn't the first time that NASCAR's top division has competed here in the state of Indiana. They ran. A, a division race at the Winchester Speedway in October of 1950, and then there was a race in July of 1952 at the South Bend Motor Speedway, a half-mile dirt track. But without question, this is the biggest race that NASCAR has ever run in the state of Indiana. Did you announce either one of those races? I wasn't around back. Well, I was, but I wasn't in a position to announce them, Benny. Were you racing back then? <laughs> <laughs> Here's Gordon again, trying to get alongside. Can't make it. Thought maybe he had it that time. Looks like Jeff Gordon's picked up some push to me as he comes off the corner. Looks like he's not able to keep the car on the bottom like you would like to. Yeah, he's much higher exiting the corner. And A.J. Boyd has brought his car back into the pit area. They're changing tires on the right side. That's uh, the Jim Bound pit crew, Jeff Hensman and his crew, that stepped in to pit the AJ Ford car. You saw, wow. He was Did he hit the wall? Well, he came very close to it. He was very loose coming off the third turn. Jack Arood has a report on Jeff Gordon. Well, Benny Parsons, you haven't lost your touch. Indeed, Jeff Gordon has gotten a little bit of a push 
coming out of the corner. They had it earlier in the day, and the track came to them. It seems when the fuel load goes down, it tends to go away. So they're not really that concerned about it. It just makes it a lot tougher to go for the lead. Yo, Jack, we can see as he comes off the corner how the car drifts up towards the wall as he jerks it away from the wall. Then he's losing the back end once in a while. Jeff Gordon has led 43 laps of this event while Jeff Bodine continues to rack up the laps led. He now has been in front for 24 circuits. Oh, we have a crash. That's Mike Chase over against the wall, the black car, and looks like Dave Marcus, the yellow car down in the grass. Looks like there's heavy damage to the front end of the car driven by Mike Chase there against the wall in turn number two. And Dave Marcus has sustained some heavy damage on the left front of his car also. Well, there is heavy damage to that 50 car. Got that Tyson hood all warped up. He is the NASCAR Winston West points leader, and he had a guaranteed starting position before he ever came here. The Winston what? West Series got one provisional, and he got it. What a huge break this was for Jeff Bodine. I'll bet you he doesn't talk and pass pit road this time. <laughs> But our concern right now is on the condition of Mike Chase and Dave Marcus after an accident in turn number two. Elmo Langley has the pace car out there and the field in tow. Looks like that Dave is moving around in there. He's okay. Yes, we see him moving around. Let's see if we can see what happened. Looks like that Chase did make contact with the Dave Marcus car and then Dave slid to the inside and Chase kept it against the wall. Pit road is closed for the moment, but since the pace car is out there, it will be open soon for scheduled pit stops. The safety crew has arrived at the Mike Chase car, and so we are under caution for the fourth time here in the inaugural Brickyard 400. Jeff Bodine leads Jeff Gordon, Ernie Irvin, Rusty Wallace, and Brett Bodine. That guy walked away a little bit ago like there was nothing to it, but... Uh Don't eat all those Tostitos, Paige. Leave me one, will you? <laughs> no, I don't want any. <laughs> Get out of here. Oh, good. Very good. No, I don't think so. We no. can we can do that. Well, yeah, that'd be fine. Sure, yeah. yeah.
back at Indianapolis, the Brickyard 400. Some of those missing from today that the fans certainly wish would be here. With our coverage of ABC Sports here at the Brickyard, two of our technicians, Jimmy Shearer and Phil Tabusi, recently passed away. We feel their loss here very much as well. Mike Chase did climb out of that car with the help of the crew, so he appears to be okay. And we are under yellow, our second real accident yellow of the day here. The focus continues to stay on the front of the field. And we continue to watch Jeff Gordon. Monday night, ABC Sports will be in upstate New York as Jim Kelly leads his four-time defending AFC champion Buffalo Bills against the rebuilding Washington Redskins in a primetime preseason special. Live coverage begins at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, Monday night here on ABC Sports. So we're learning things at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the presence of the Winston Cup cars. They can race side by side, and they can pass in the corners, and they can put on a great show. We have seen that throughout the afternoon. The Budweiser airship, 194 feet long. That's two-thirds the length of a football field. Floats over the speedway and helps give us some of the great aerial coverage. It helps give you a perspective of how these cars are maneuvering around the course. Out of the race thus far, Jimmy Spencer in the early going. And then in this accident, Chase and Dave Marcus both out of the running. The only three cars of the 43 that started here today. So at Indianapolis, it is yellow under a bright blue sky and sunshine. The car is proving to be very, very sensitive to this race course and the crews having some trouble adjusting to that sensitivity. But so far, there has been some terrific racing here at Indianapolis. Let's go to Jackaroo. Well, Paul, he had to use a provisional to get in. It looked as if he was going to be, have a great finish because he went to the front early. But now, Harry Gant, you're out. Yeah, the car, it just ran super. Uh, you know, we never did run real hard all day. We just sort of checking these tires out. The Hoosiers were doing a great job there. And the last time we was running, you know, we picked it up a little bit, and there wasn't any trouble to stay up, you know. And so I felt like we are going to have a real good finish today. But I broke an axle or something here now when I come out of the pits. A lot of people, Mark Martin mentioned the fact that maybe it was due to the concrete that it's a little more difficult. You guys are used to having a pit road that is maybe a little more blacktop. Well, I, I don't know. Uh, it, it's been, a, it acted funny when I started the race, you know, it had a twitch in the back end. So uh, I think it's the, the, one of the gears broke there where it's pulling actually. Well, Paul, they call him the old timer and this is his first and last race in the Brickyard. Yeah. Let's check in with Gary Gerald. And we're alongside Robert Yates, who's keeping a close eye on Ernie Irvin. You started 17th, you're up here in fourth, and you've been slowly, quietly working your way into contention. Are you happy with the way the day's progressing thus far? Well, you know, we've been a little spoiled. We'd be used to go right straight to the front or start near the front and lead all the laps. And, you know, we feel pretty bad right now, but, you know, we we're, we're keep working on the chassis a little bit and the engine's a little bit soft, but we want to be here all day. And uh, if we can keep this pace up, we might win this thing yet. Number one in points, and they've still got some optimism here as we go to Jerry Punch. Paul Andrews, a crew chief for Jeff Bodine. And, Paul, you guys were high-fiving and jumping and up and down after that pit stop. You think you'd won the Super Bowl. Uh, why the excitement? Well, it's a good pit stop. It's a 17-and-a-half-second stop. We uh, come in first and went out first, and that's a good deal for us. You know, uh, it's uh, you know we still got another stop to go here on this race, but uh, anything can happen. We're looking forward to the rest of it and think we can win it. Hoping to take this Exide Auto Express forward to victory lane. We'll just have to see what happens here. Update the tire situation. You've got to be very pleased. The Hoosiers are uh, showing well. Oh, yeah, they're showing real good. You know, if we had a little more tire temperature, Bob, we could be a little bit faster. Uh, maybe next next year we'll be a little bit better, but this is a real good tire. Hoosier made a real good tire here today, and we're extremely happy with it. He's talking about Bob Newton, the president of Hoosier Tires, and Paul, normally they complain about having too much temperature. Here they're complaining about not quite enough. Yeah, it is unusually cool here in Indianapolis for the month of August. Here is the pit summary of the cars as they went in to the pits and how they came out. So you can see there have been some changes, and look, Darrell Waltrip moved up into third place at the Brickyard 400. DW is right up there, isn't he? What did he do? Just change, put gas in it or something? Did he? Uh-huh. 
26, 7, 17, 24, 2, 28, 11, 18, 4, 25. 10, 7, Just 5, keep track of the three car. That's what matters. <laughs> <laughs> this little you still deal think right? he's going to win? No question in my oh, mind. Oh, <laughs> you're all wet. <laughs> this little deal right here said he's 15. <laughs> well, that's, that yeah, can well. change. These numbers have been changing a lot here. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the cars have run a half a lap under green. Brett Bodine is the 11th leader of the day and with his lead he becomes the third Bodine to lead in the event and there was contact between Jeff and Brett. Looks like there might have been some contact between those two cars because Brett got his car. He's oh! And a Jeff Bodine spin coming off turn four right in front of the entire field. Look at everybody going to the inside to try to avoid the trouble. Some coming down pit road. Well, you saw their contact between brothers, Brett and Jeff. There was minor contact of the two in turn three. And when they come off turn four, it looked like there was more contact. And Jeff spun around in front of the entire field. There's Dale Jarrett, whose car has been severely damaged in the incident. Looks like only two cars involved in this, Jeff Bodine and Dale Jarrett. Amazingly, because Amazingly. there were a lot of drivers that were coming down on the Bodine and Jarrett cars, but somehow they avoid hitting them. Jeff is okay. You can see him climbing out of his car and waving to the fans. Now the safety crews are at Dale Jarrett's car. Now let's take a look at the initial contact in turn three, Benny. Go down in the corner. That's Brett in the green car. Jeff in the black number seven. And that just a little bit of a nudge. And Brett gets the car a little bit out of shape. Now then we're going through the short shoot between three and four. Jeff takes the lead from Brett. Goes in the corner, Brett comes down. Is there contact? Yep, just a little bit of a touch. Around goes Jeff. Brett's able to get by while the car is spinning. The roof flaps come up, do their job, keep the car on the ground. Man, oh man. There is Jeff Bodine assessing the damage. Now this is from Daryl Waltrip's roof cam. They have just touched. Let's see how Daryl maneuvers through. Boy, Benny, you just hope the smoke clears enough that you can see to get by. Well, folks, 
you saw what Daryl Walter saw for a couple of times, nothing. All you can see is the smoke. It's just uh, a matter of taking a chance from another angle. There's the contact. Jeff goes around. Brett escapes unscathed. And look how everybody avoids this incident. Many go to the left here, some down pit road. But as Brett comes back across the track, he makes heavy contact with Dale Jarrett. That's unbelievable. I wonder if there's a speed limit down pit road under this kind of a situation. <laughs> It's a good thing there was a pit road there or several of those cars would have been into the wall. Once again, here's the from our speed shot. Real speed from Daryl Waltrip's roof cam. just a matter of luck at that point when you see something go it wrong really in front well. of you you just hope that you can avoid it and he did so an accident here has eliminated Jeff Bodine and Dale Jarrett and we'll be back with more from the Brickyard 400 after this message and a word from our ABC stations Man, what a mess. That could have been a lot nastier. Mm -hmm. yeah, Number yeah. three is towed out. Show Paige that. other cars coming through there got together pretty good. They just slapped off yeah, each other. I saw they? that. I don't know who it was. So. Man, that is not what I would call brotherly love. Yeah, I don't want to be home with those guys. <laughs> you know. Hey, brother, come over here a minute. <laughs> Have a little conversation. We'll see like, how Bill survived. Looks like huh? Brett did some pretty good scraping down the wall. Though. Yeah, he did. I would think we'll probably see the penalty yeah. box. You guys with this, we'll probably see the penalty box. That's Rusty and somebody who, Bobby uh, Hillen maybe, slapped <laughs> yeah, Rusty and Bobby Hill and slap. Yeah. Oh wait, did that was that the 28 car that hit him? As he went by? No, guess not. Back that up again, Bob. Ooh, there's er look at Earnhardt making contact with who is that? Voight? Yeah. It looks like it. Yeah, that's what it is. Oh, that's good right there, Bob. Back up just a little bit, little bit. Okay, all now. All kinds of folks in there. Let's see that one more time. Pit Road is closed. The other guy's gone. Is Puncher a route gone to the garage? I saw Jared go back. back. You want, you want Jared? Jared? Come back right here. Okay. Our fifth caution of the day is out because of an accident in turn number four. Here it is in replay. Jeff Bodine gets a tap from his brother, comes off the corner. Now these guys are just dodging. It looks like, and there Dale Jarrett comes in, and Earnhardt makes some contact right there. He hits A.J. Force car, it looks like. We don't quite see him make the contact. In any case, a very serious looking accident. Here is Jack Aroot. Well, there Jarrett trying to get some refreshment back, build some liquids back. What happened out there? It looked like melee on the front stretch. Uh, yeah, I guess somebody turned the seven car and he told me to go low, and that's what I saw, and I went low, and as I was going by, I saw Jeff's car come off the wall. I messed up, basically. Uh, I thought he was going to come all the way down to the inside, and I slowed and was going to go back to the outside of him, and uh, I should have kept on by low, and I could have probably gotten by. And uh, Just unfortunate. We had a pretty good race car here, and uh, definitely uh, something that could run in the top five, but we kept adjusting on it. It's just a, a shame that it had to happen. 
Bob, it never ceases to amaze me that after crashing at over 180 miles an hour, any driver could sit and recount what happened. That is amazing. Let's take a look at exactly what he's talking about. Now, now he's the green car. The green car right on the right side of the screen. You see, he's starting. Now he decides that Bodine is going to keep going across the racetrack, but all of a sudden, it looks like he might have some contact with the 28 car. All of a sudden, Bodine stopped going across the racetrack and spun and goes up and just about gets Schrader. Looks like Schrader might have, might have gotten by okay, though. Now, when Dale Jarrett was referring to they told me to go inside, he was talking about his spotters, and that's just another example of how important spotters are to these drivers. All right, well, let's take a look now at our race summary after 100 laps. Brett Bodine leading the average speed a little over 131 miles an hour. We've had 11 leaders, 14 lead changes, five caution periods for a total of 17 laps. Three cars are out of the race. They are Spencer, Chase, and Marcus. And now we can add, since then, Bodine and Jarrett. In the pits is Dale Earnhardt. And they're looking at the right front of the car because he did have contact with somebody. I believe it was Foyt. Look at that huge pair of pliers, channel locks they have under there working on something. I guess they're trying to adjust the front end. Also, beat the fender away from the tire. Adjust the toe end is what I'm talking about. You'll probably come back in one more time and they'll check it with a string just to make sure it's straight. If they were, in fact, changing the toe end. Earnhardt moving back out onto the racetrack, and there are the spotters. There are two sets of them here because you can't see all the way around this track. These are the spotters that are stationed in turn four, watching for things on the track that they can try to tell their drivers to avoid. Now, once again, let's go back and take a look at the initial contact between Brett, who is leading here, and Jeff coming up. Going in turn three, Brett's leading the race. Jeff Bodine gets on the throttle just a little bit faster than Brett, a little bit of contact. Brett gets sideways, goes up the racetrack. Now, when they go in turn four, he's going to go back and just touch the seven car, which sends him into a spin. And again, we're talking about brothers here, Jeff and Brett Bodine, and... Uh, well, I don't know. There's not much brotherly love displayed here. Watch Brett as he comes up in the green car and just touches the seven. And with the contact, he spun around, resulting in quite an accident. Here's Gary Gerald. Well, Jeff Bodine making the long walk back and the high hopes of a great finish on this day at Indianapolis, this inaugural day, washed out. Now, was it contact with your brother? Can you tell us what happened? Yeah, we're really running good out there. Hi, Kathy and Barry back home. I love you guys. Yeah, uh, Brett spun me out. Uh, we've had some family problems and personal problems between us here lately, and he just unfortunately took it out on the racetrack with me and uh, never expected he'd do it. He's my brother, I still love him, but he spun me out. When will you talk to him? Pardon? When will you talk to him? Uh, he won't talk to me, so maybe never. How about the disappointment, Jeff? The disappointment of having, you know, lost an opportunity on this monumental day. Well, I'm more disappointed about my brother. I love him, and uh, I just don't hit like having problems like this. Boy, he obviously wants to get back in the emotion. It's heartrending right down here. Wow, unexpected. That is a tough situation to be in, I'll tell you. Man, that's unbelievable. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. well, you they, know, they had a problem at Talladega in practice back in May, just before the uh, Winston 500. Uh, and I think since then, they're really, uh, they haven't had each other over for Sunday dinner. They have formed the two abreast lineup for the restart. Now, the question is, was Brett's car damaged in that incident? There wasn't any major contact, but he did get up very high and scraped the wall in the fourth turn, and maybe there was some damage to uh, his car in the incident. Well, evidently, he feels like the contact was insignificant. He doesn't want to lose the track position. The tires are fresh, so he's going to stay out there. Jeff Gordon is lined up right behind him. Darrell Waltrip is now in third position with Rusty Wallace fourth and Ernie Irvin running in fifth position. We're getting set for the restart here. When they come down, they'll complete 105 out of 160 laps. As Jeff Burton on the inside, the blue and white number eight, Jimmy Hensley in 55, Burton is 19th, Hensley is 20th, Bobby Hill in the black number 44, he's 21st position. Joe Nemechek being shown in 22nd, Wally Dollin back in 23rd, Greg Saxon 24th, 
as the field moves off of corner number four looking for the restart. Doyle Ford looks them over very carefully as they come down slowly. Now he raises his right hand and displays the flag and we're back to racing. They restart the race in second gear, shift to third gear, and in the fourth. Well, I'll tell you, Jeff Gordon really came down on the Jeff Burton automobile. Burton slides up the racetrack right in front of Darrell Walker. The most dominant car, if there indeed has been one so far in this race, has been Jeff Gordon. The rest of the field comes off the corner. Look at this. Movement down the back stretch. Three abreast, four abreast in some locations. And Gordon now takes a look to the inside in the short shoot. Is he going to get the lead here in turn four? Yes, he does. Gordon goes back into the lead. And look at Jeff Burton. He's able to pull back right up on the back bumper of Brett Bodine. He is a lap down in that number eight car. And the question, since Jeff Bodine has fallen out of the race, is there anyone that can race with Jeff Gordon? I think that's going to be the question for the remaining laps in this race. Here's Waltrip, Rusty Wallace, and Ernie Irvin. Rusty in fourth. Daryl Waltrip, who has been so outspoken uh, about how great it is to run here. Waltrip called this the holy land of auto racing. He said <laughs> this will be the most remembered, most monumental, and most cherished race that he has ever been in. And I tell you what, Daryl Waltrip is running pretty well. There he is, a face camera watching Daryl as he goes in the corner. And like Elliot, he's just gradually turning the steering wheel. He's in the short shoot, second corner. Looks like his car is pretty tight, Bob, because he's holding a lot of pressure to the left. Just now out for a Saturday afternoon drive, running in third position. Now Ernie Irvin closes in on the back of Rusty Wallace's car. Here's a running order after 107 laps. Look for your favorite driver to see how he's doing in the inaugural Brickyard 400. There are 18 cars on the lead lap. Sean Andretti in 30th position. Race for third, Rusty's on the inside, ODW. Takes that third spot away, now there goes Irvin, takes fourth. So, Waltrip loses a couple of positions here in one corner as he's passed by both Wallace and Irvin. And now to the outside, that's Ward Burton in car number 31. He is not on the lead lap, he's five laps down in 34th position. Here comes Sterling Marlin. He, Bill Elliott has been able to get by. That is for position. Sterling Marlin takes a look to the inside, trying to take a spot away. That would be the sixth spot. Marlin looks to the inside off the second corner, but for the moment, Waltrip holds him off. Now Darrell will go to the low side. Still hangs on to the position. Sterling as he comes off the corner he'll try to get alongside Daryl can't make it I believe he's got a good run on him now BP yes it looks like it and there goes Sterling Marlin cleanly by Daryl Waltrip into turn number one Darryl 
Carroll backs off, touches the brake lightly. Now back on the throttle as he goes by the sweeps over turn two. All right, now let's take you back just a few minutes ago to the incident between the brothers, Brett Bodine in 26 and Jeff in number seven. There were two incidents of contact. This was the first. Going in turn three. The 26 car, Brett, gets a little tap from the seven, his brother Jeff. Now going in turn four, he's going to return the favor. But unfortunately, it's not a love tap. It's pretty serious, and it sends the seven car into a spin right in front of the entire field. This was, this was for the lead of the race. Around goes Jeff. And there's about 40 of them bearing down on him right now. Dr. Jerry Punch has more on this family feud. Unfortunately, Bob, a classic case of brotherly shove involved here. And I, since Brett Bodine cannot speak for himself, is still in the car. I am with his wife, Diane. And Diane, now you have spoken, but what did Brett say on the radio happen? Brett said Jeff had got right up behind him to make the pass, and his car got loose. And Jeff dove in front of him, and it was and he didn't run into him intentional. I heard Jeff's quote that they'd have been having family problems, but Brett's just upset that everybody has family problems but he would never intentionally try and knock his brother in a in a wall for fear of hurting him you know what happened what well, he feels terrible but what happened was certainly never anything intentional so personal problems aside nothing would ever happen on the racetrack between these two exactly that would never knock jeff into a wall i mean you know as bad as i feel for the both of them Brett didn't, if Brett wins the race, he wants to be Jeff on a racetrack, not off a racetrack. That's Diane Bodine, Brett Bodine's wife, trying to comment for her husband on behalf of what occurred up in turns three and four. Brett Bodine continuing to hang on to second. We do have a new third place competitor. That is Ernie Irvin, who has gotten around Rusty Wallace. And Robert Yates said they've been working on the car. They've been adjusting the car. It looks like they've got it just a little bit better than when they started. 48 laps are remaining out of 160. Right now, Jeff Gordon has a rather comfortable lead on Brett Bodine as they move down the straightaway. But then behind Bodine, a good battle is going on. The car there running second in line is Jeff Burton. He is not on the lead lap. He is in 19th position a lap down. We'll be back with more of our live coverage of the Brickyard 400 after 112 laps. It's Jeff Gordon, Brett Bodine, Ernie Urban, Rusty Wallace, and Bill Elliott. Thing, Bobby. I haven't heard from my spotters, haven't said anything that's come out of the hospital, so I haven't gone back there. I've been up here with the... Uh, they chase it. Yep. Jeff. Okay, thanks. I'm just going to stay in the Brentwood Iron Pit then. Yes, we do. Yes, we do.
here comes Ernie. Rusty's going to pass them both, looks like. Mm -hmm. Positions are changing here in the Brickyard 400. Jeff Gordon remains the leader, but Ernie Irvin has moved to second. Rusty Wallace has moved to third, putting Brett Bodine back to fourth. Jeff Gordon the leader. There is Ernie Irvin running in second spot. Rusty Wallace in third. Brett Bodine in fourth position. And running fifth is Bill Elliott. Now the cars are going through the fourth corner. And we can see what kind of lead that Jeff Gordon has about half this front straightaway. As Ernie Irvin gets to the start finish line, Gordon goes down in turn one. Irvin is, of course, the NASCAR Winston Cup points leader going into this event with a 16-point edge on Dale Earnhardt. By the way, is running in 13th position. Earnhardt is running 13th. A.J. Foyt is in 33rd position. He is four laps down to the leader. A.J. really caught a tough break when he ran out of fuel coming off the second corner. Yes, he did. Might also update the pole sitter, Rick Mast, who has also fallen a lap down. He is in 26th position. There comes another Bodine, Todd Bodine. By the way, all three Bodines have led the race today. Yep. As a matter of fact, two pairs of brothers have led the Indianapolis 500. Louis and Gaston Chevrolet and Bobby and Al Unser. But today we did have all three Bodines taking a crack up front. like he might be just a tick faster. He's right now behind Jeff Gordon. Ernie Irvin is 4.21 seconds. And we'll keep track of that and see if Ernie is gaining or losing ground to the leader. The highest running rookie in the race is Jeff Burton, who is in 19th position, a lap down. There is Bill Elliott. And there, and there is Burton. Jeff Burton, yeah. Here's Elliott, Ward Burton, that's the car direct in front of Bill Elliott, as you mentioned a moment ago, he's four or five laps down. Another set of brothers. Yes. But whatever problem caused Ward to get five laps down, he has corrected because he passed Bill Elliott and uh, drove away. Or didn't drive away, he's just a few car lengths in front of Bill. Accelerator right at about the apex of the turn. And all the way down the front straightaway, hard on the throttle. Until right here, he backs off, applies the brakes to slow the car down. Right down on the rumble strips. We've completed 120 laps, 300 miles, just 100 miles left to go. Jeff Gordon from Pittsburgh, Indiana, is the leader at this point. And here's our host, Paul Page. Well, get those game cards ready now. It's time for the Budweiser Pace Car Sweepstakes. The 300-mile leader, as you saw, was Jeff Gordon. So write down Jeff Gordon on your 3x5 card, and you could win one of four 1995 Chevrolet Monte Carlos, the official pace car of the Brickyard 400. And stay tuned for the final lap. It's your last chance to win. Brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. 
So Jeff Gordon is still the man to watch at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway as he continues to pull away from the remainder of the field. Of course, he has some very personal aspects riding with him. Most of his life, he grew up not far from here, graduated from high school close to here, and did most of its early racing right here in central Indiana. 16 changes thus far among 11 drivers in a race in which we have proven that you can, in fact, run side by side in a stock car at Indianapolis. Now back to Bob Jenkins and Benny Parsons. It's been a very competitive race. It has been a competitive race, and it looks like that you can't come home again. Jeff Gordon is back in Indiana, where he grew up, and is doing very well. There is the interval once again between first and second. Ernie Irving is second. Rusty Wallace, the gold and black, is number three. The green car is Fred Bodine. He's our fourth place car. Jeff Gordon displayed so much emotion when he won his first NASCAR Winston Cup race earlier this year at Charlotte Motor Speedway, and I can imagine what it's going to be like if he should hold on to win this one, but we still got a long way to go. Gordon led after 120 laps, the average speed 128.6, 11 leaders, and 15 lead changes, five caution periods for 21 laps, five cars are out of the race. All of those have been as the result of accidents. Here's Jack Aroot. Well, Bob, this man was accountable for the first stock car ever to test at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and that was an IROC car. Ray Evernham was with IROC at the time, and now you're the crew chief on Jeff Gordon's car, and it looks like so far it's been a Sunday in the park for you guys. Well, I don't know about that. You know, it's um, a lot of tough competition out here. Jeff just picked up on his place. He's doing a great job. My hat's off to all of these guys that worked so hard getting this car ready. I'm really happy. But early on, you had a push. It seems to go away as the race goes on, and then it sneaks back. Right now, what's he reporting on the car condition? Well, our car's pretty balanced, and as the sun goes in and out, we've been playing with one or two pounds of air pressure, and that's all we've done. Uh, we had a little bit of problem with a jack on a pit stop and got us a little behind, but... You know, we just got our fingers crossed, and, and, we're, and we're praying to God we want this one real bad. And I want to say hi to Casey Elliott, uh, Ernie's son. He, he, he can't be here, but uh, we're, we're looking after you, and you just keep fighting. And Benny and Bob, when you ask Jeff Gordon who's accountable for his success in the last year and a half, he points to this man right here. He says communication is the key in auto racing, and he says he and I communicate excellently. Jeff Gordon is the trying to become the second person to win races at both Daytona and Indianapolis in the same year. A.J. Foyt won the Pepsi Firecracker in 1964 in the Indy 500, and Jeff won the Bush Clash this year at Daytona. The battle now between Brett Bodine and Bill Elliott for fourth spot. This is down the back straightaway, through the golf course, the Brickyard Crossings, trying to get a draft off the 26 car to pull by. Did not get a very good run that time. And look, Rusty Wallace has passed Ernie Irvin for that spot. New second place runner is Rusty Wallace. Irvin back to third. Rusty Wallace looks like it's one car. They're so close down the straightaway. They have a good draft going. Elliott gets by Fred Bodine, takes over that four spot. Now Ernie Urban takes a look to Rusty Wallace on the inside. Comes up him off the corner. Let's see if he makes a move here on the straightaway. He looked like he had a run as he came off the corner, but he was not able to draft by. Rusty will lead down in turn one. As a result of a big disappointment at Talladega a few weeks ago, Rusty Wallace has fallen to fourth in the point standings, 289 behind the leader, Ernie Irvin. While we watch this battle, we will tell you that Dale Earnhardt has moved up to 10th position. 
problems that he has encountered during the race today have not affected him a great deal as he is on the move again, it seems. Once again, here's a run in order after 126 laps. Terry Labonte back in 12th spot. Kenny Schrader having a good run. He's in eighth. Michael Walter, 15th. Lake Speed is in 16th position after taking a provisional to get in. There you see that 21, rather 18 cars are on the lead lap. And then John Andretti a couple laps down in 29th. Here goes Irving trying to get alongside Rusty. Does he have a run? I think he does. Looks like he does. Boy, these two cars are evenly matched. Going into second position is Ernie Irvin with Rusty Wallace back to third. But both of them are chasing down the leader of the Brickyard 400. That's Jeff Gordon. We'll be right back. Is Gordon stretching it out? Yeah, Kevin, sure. Got a stopwatch you're using? You're using your stopwatch? Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yep, yeah. Yeah, we do. Yes. Yeah. When's the last time they pitted? When's the last time they pitted? This is a good battle right here. If Bill Elliott can get by these guys pretty quick, he might have a shot. But if he fools with them for about 10 laps, he's history. Caution. Who is it? Hensley and uh, Bickle? No. 07. Back live with ABC's coverage of the inaugural Brickyard 400 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and the caution comes out again. Another accident, this one involving Jeff Brabham and another car. Did you see who it was, Benny? Jimmy Hensley. Hensley was able to drive away from the accident. He was down to the inside. Brabham's car came in the middle of the racetrack, as you can see. Came to a stop, and uh, there's Hensley. We see some damage to the left front of that car as he's... The fender is rubbing the tire. That's where all the smoke is coming from. Hensley the was left running. rear is flat. He was running in 27th position, and Brabham was 30th. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like there were that Brabham got into the wall, and then as he came down to the inside, he hit Hensley. Yeah, the 0-2 car, the green car right behind Brabham, was Derek Cope. This is our sixth caution of the day. Now we are going to see some pit stops, Benny, and are they within the window? They can go the rest of the way. They can go the rest of the way. This is who beats who out of the pits. Can Rusty Wallace's crew, they've been doing it all year, can they once again put Rusty out in front, try to win the race? There are 30 laps to go. 130 laps have been completed. And if they do, can he keep Jeff Gordon behind him? Exactly. Gordon has been the best car on the racetrack, but it could come down to the pit work. There is the opening of pit road. And Jeff Gordon's crew, they call themselves the Rainbow Warriors. 
Those on the lead lap are able to pit this time by. All others cannot pit this time, but can when they come around again. Gordon leads Irvin, Wallace, Elliott, and others at 55 miles an hour down pit road. Irvin dives in the pits. Right side's going up. Rusty must be overheating because they had a brush over there, brushing off the front of the car. Jeff Ford changing the right side, brushing the grill off. Jackman comes around. A chassis adjustment. Put one round the wedge in the car. Rusty's moving. Ernie's moving. Jeff Ford is moving, but it's Rusty Wallace is going to beat him out. 15.9 second pit stop for Rusty Wallace. And he beats his competitors out of the pits. Very important track position. Less than 16 seconds for Rusty Wallace. Boy, they're high five now, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> could be set up now for the finish of the race. We'll be back with more from the Brickyard 400 after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Oh, great. Wow. Wow. You'll get fired, Goodrich. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want and you to lose your job. Paige is going wild <laughs> when he heard that. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. Great. You see what they broke out when Jeff Bodine crashed? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, it hasn't been up there all day. <laughs> Gary with Buddy, okay. Tommy? Yeah. Forget the Penske connection. Yeah. Right, okay. Slim. Where is Roger Dodger? Over in the second corner or the first? Or and the suite's right He's down here, Betty. He's up right up there. Uh, who is GW you keep talking about? JW. Uh, Jim Williams. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. That has been a major factor in his wins. Yes. There could be the story of the race. tell the story of the race, the pit summary. Gordon in first, out second, Irvin second to third, and Wallace, there is the story. He comes out in first position ahead of everyone else with some great pit crew work. Watch Buddy Fire as he jumps up and down says go as he watches the 24 car. Yes, they know now they've got him beaten. Yes, they jump up and down and Jeff Gordon tries to get back out, can't quite make it. Let's go down to Gary Gerald, who's with Buddy Parrott. And Buddy right now is giving his driver the word, I think, that they're going to go green in the next lap. A lot of emotion after sensational pit stop. We had 15, 9, and 16 seconds on two different clocks. Well, I'll tell you what, these guys did an excellent job. They've been doing it all year, last year, this year. Every time they had to answer the call, you know, they come to the rescue. And Rusty's driving a great race out there. I just like to, I like to say hello to all the girls that, uh, that these uh, pit crew guys, their wives and everything, because 
they uh, they'd love to be up here, but uh, they're not today. But anyway, that pit stops for y'all. Not only did the crew go nuts with the elation of that stop, so did these thousands of people. The crowd loved that stop. Well, I tell you what, uh, I get cold chills every once in a while, and uh, that was a great deal. Uh, this is quite a race. I hope the fans are enjoying it. Hope the fans on TV, ABC's enjoying it. And uh, this Miller Genuine Draft uh, Ford, I tell you what, I, I'd love to pull this thing off, but you never know. All right, buddy, Barrett, savor in this moment. It may be a moment that wins him the race. The Bud One Airship and its Eye in the Sky camera are proud to provide you these pictures from more than 1,000 feet above the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Well, while Rusty Wallace is in the lead, next Sunday there's more racing action here on ABC as IndyCar's best head to mid-Ohio for a road course challenge. The Miller Genuine Draft 200 live coverage begins at 3 Eastern, 2 Central, and Pacific here on ABC Sports. Jeff Gordon will restart in second position. We've been monitoring his radio, and he says regarding his second position, that's all right. We've got now about 27 laps to go, and we can beat them on the racetrack, but that is the question right now. He's got to pass them, and then we found that passing at this racetrack can be difficult. Sterling Marlin in the four car was running six, had to come back in the pits. He's all the way at the tail end of the long line there, back in 17th spot. But meanwhile, it's going to be decided between those first five cars. I think our winner will come from Rusty, Jeff Gordon, Ernie Irvin, Brett Bodine, or Bill Elliott. Let's watch Jeff Gordon because we also hear that he's been told to try to get Rusty on the restart. Get this pass over quickly and then pull away. But well, let's see if that happens when the green flag comes out. The cars are now entering turn number four. The pace car about to pull off the racetrack for the restart of what could be the final segment of racing in this inaugural event. They come slowly off of corner number four. Wallace at the head of the line. Gordon is second, then Ernie Irvin, then Brett Bodine and Bill Elliott. There we see Rusty accelerate. He's on the throttle. Name moves down to the inside, trying to protect that inside from Jeff Gordon. Jeff is not going to be able to get the advantage on the restart. Here they come into the first turn, and Rusty's got the lead. And now we continue to think about the Roger Penske connection. He's the owner of this car. Rusty Wallace. He won the Indianapolis 500 this year. He has won it nine previous times, but Gordon makes a move to the inside in the backstretch. Does he have the lead in three? Yes, he does. Now then, Rusty and Ernie Irvin almost made contact as they came off that second corner. Here's Rusty trying to get back on the inside, and he is back on the inside, Bob. Jeff has got to give him room. They're going to come through turn number four side by side and onto the straightaway. Some great racing, and again, they touch as they come down the straightaway. It's Wallace to the inside, and Jeff Gordon to the outside, and Ernie Irvin is a factor, too. Now, Jeff can't get back to the inside because Ernie is there. Jeff Gordon's going to try to pass him on the outside, Bob. Can they run two abreast through the corner? You bet you they can. Gordon goes back ahead as Rusty gets a little loose in the second corner. And here comes Ernie. Rambo not trying to follow him. Jeff Gordon protecting that low line. But he is moving away from Wallace, who may have a problem. It looks like Rusty has a problem of some kind. So now it is Jeff Gordon and Ernie Irvin and Brett Bodine and Bill Elliott who are running first through fourth. Daryl Waltrip is in fifth position, and Rusty has fallen back to sixth. Rusty did not go for the pitch, so evidently he does not have a problem. Just got the bar a little bit loose. Gary Gerald is in Rusty's pit. And the crew here says there is no problem for Wallace. It's just all the traffic congestion. They say everything's okay as far as they know. Well, no, it's not okay, Gary. 
because he was leading and now he's back to about six spots. But Benny, there was a lot of traffic back there at the end of the back stretch and he just had to get off the accelerator. Now he perhaps is making his way back to the front as he goes to the inside of Greg Sachs. And look who's right behind him, Mark Martin, but then Dale Earnhardt is back there. Mark Martin, of course, is several laps down, 20 laps down as a matter of fact. He spent several laps in the pit repairing a faulty clutch. But there is Dale Earnhardt in 11th position. Gordon continues to lead. He has about a six or seven car length advantage on Ernie Irvin. There is Dale Earnhardt moving to the inside of Greg Sachs. That's not for position. Greg Sachs in the 77 car is one lap down. But meanwhile, Earnhardt has worked his way back up to seventh spot. Never count this guy out of the race. He had contact with the full sitter, Rick Mast, and contact with the wall in the very first lap. He has had several other problems during the race, but he has stayed on the lead lap and can't be counted out as a potential winner even yet. Darrell Waltrip in fifth spot. There's D.W. right in front of Rusty Wallace. And now we jump inside the Budweiser board driven by Bill Elliott. could get by Brett Bodine, he might have a shot because I think his car is really good on long runs, 15, 20 lap runs. Boy, we saw some tremendous racing there for a while. Things have settled down now. We've still got over 20 laps to go with Jeff Gordon, the leader, back in a moment. That was great. <laughs> Yes! Man, oh man. That was pretty good stuff. Yes, it was. That, that was uh, worth the price of admission right there. This might be too. Keep an eye on Earnhardt. Huh? <laughs> yeah. you, got, you guys are having a great day. You're doing a Thank superb you. job. Oh, man. Oh, Ernie is just right there, and he, he could get the lead right here. Yep. First time the 28th led today. Okay. Oh, what happened to Elliot? Lost a little, didn't he? Yeah, Daryl's trying to get by. Oh! oh, 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 oh. Earnhardt, I mean. Welcome back to ABC's live coverage of the Brickyard 400, and we have a new leader, the 13th different leader of the race. Ernie Irvin has gone around Jeff Gordon. But Jeff Gordon is right there. Ernie hasn't went any place. 
The question is, Jack Root, did Jeff Gordon allow Ernie Urban to go around? Well, Bob Jenkins, what happened is he's been battling a loose condition, so Gordon radioed in and said the car's getting looser and looser, and the call was made from the pits, let Ernie Urban go by, save it for later. And then they ended the conversation with being told, they said to Jeff, remember, you're the man, you're the man today. But is he? We're going to find out. This is a classic battle. A Ford, a Chevrolet. Man, I thought this was going to be on the wall. It looked like they came off the corner very, very high. 18 laps to go now. Jeff Gordon chases Ernie Irvin. Brent Bodine is third, Bill Elliott fourth, Rusty Wallace is fifth, Daryl Waltrip is sixth, and Dale Earnhardt is in seventh position. They want to look like Jeff Gordon almost grazed that wall coming off that corner with 18 laps to go. And remember what happened 18 laps to go? Emerson Fittipaldi hit the wall with just 18 laps to go, allowing Al Unser Jr. to win the 500, Indianapolis 500. Ernie's getting a little loose. See that wiggle in the back of the car? Yep. Gordon took a look to the inside as they came down the straightaway. Let's see what his strategy is as they come out of two and head down the long back stretch. He's tucked right on the back bumper of Ernie Irvin. Now, once again, takes a look to the inside, but he'll make no attempt to make the pass. I tell you, Bob, that must be an exceptional engine in that 28 car because they had a problem with it yesterday. Rather than go to a backup engine, they took that engine apart, took the oil pan off, took the rod caps off, checked the bearings to make sure they hadn't scored anything, and put the engine back together and put it back in that car to race today. Here comes Jeff. He's taking a look. He's taking a look. He might make a, an attempt at taking the lead into turn one, and he does. And the hometown crowd rises to its feet and salutes their hero, Jeff Gordon. And let's see folks wave as they go by. But did he make his move too soon? Is Ernie going to get him loose now? Remember, his car is loose with a car right behind him. Ernie Irvin has, well, won 12 NASCAR Winston Cup races. Jeff Gordon has only one in his resume. That was at Charlotte, North Carolina earlier this year. Now he's going back in front of the fans who haven't seen him leading the race, and they are on their feet applauding Jeff Gordon. He celebrated his 23rd birthday just Thursday when he qualified for the, out, for the inside of the second row. And look at the crowd waving and cheering Jeff Gordon on to victory. Man, oh man. There are 15 trips around the two and a half mile oval that Indianapolis left in this inaugural Brickyard 400. Now, if Jeff Gordon could just stay that far in front of Ernie, he'll be okay because Ernie is not close enough right now to really loosen his car up in the corners. But if Ernie pulls back up on the deck lid, he might get Jeff loose again. As they separate just a bit, let us inform you that Mike Chase is being transported to Methodist Hospital for neck x-rays. He has some contusions, but the injuries are not believed to be serious to Mike Chase. And he did walk from his race car to the ambulance. Jimmy Spencer, of course, was also taken down to Methodist for x-rays after an accident early on in the event. Gordon continues to lead, and Benny, it appears as if he is stretching it out a little bit. Looks like it. Maybe a half a car length more than the last time. The first two have pulled away from third place, Brett Bodine. There comes Brett, Bill Elliott, and Rusty Wallace, who are running third, fourth, and fifth, and Dale Earnhardt, who is sixth. You see Earnhardt has gotten by Darrell Walter. Darrell's back in seventh spot now. Ernie's not letting him get totally away, Bob. Look, he's closed back up. What's that, two car lengths? Another thing that you have to consider at this point, Benny, is experience. Jeff Gordon is only in his second year of full-time racing. But, Bob, he's done things that 
guys who've been here five years can't do. I mean, this guy point. is an exceptional race car driver, Jeff Gordon is. And a nice guy on top of that. Can you imagine what's going through his mind at this time? No, I can't. I cannot imagine. As excited as this young man was at Charlotte when he won that Coca-Cola 600, can you imagine how excited he will be if he can just pull this thing off in front of his hometown folks? Just imagine the stress he is under at this time. He knows that if he misses an entrance or an exit to the corner by two inches, he's lost the lead. He's lost the lead, and Ernie has pulled up on that back bumper. Now, can he get him loose enough to get under him off coming off the second or fourth corner? Ernie's there. Irvin is right there, as a matter of fact, now with 12 laps to go. Irvin looks like he's going to make a run on Jeff. He's looks got a like good it. momentum build off coming up off of the second corner down the back stretch. Irvin is going to go into the lead once again, or is he? You reckon Jeff is going to race him on the outside like he did Rusty? He is, Bob. Side by side in turn three. But they give each other plenty of room. They're into the short shoot, and Gordon has a half car length advantage as they go into four. Oh, Ernie got the car a little bit out of shape as he went in the corner, but they're still side by side. Now Jeff Gordon retakes the lead, and he went in that third corner on the outside of Ernie. Unbelievable. They cross the line, 11 laps to go. Here's Jack Aroos. Well, Benny, what's happening, Bob? They're, Jeff Gordon is radioing in that he's got a problem. The problem is, as you said, every time that Ernie Irvin gets up to the rear deck lift, he gets extremely loose. He was pleading those last two laps that he had to let him go by. And it looks like what might be happening right now. A replay of the last lap. Once again, Irvin moves to the inside and challenges Jeff down the back stretch. Jeff just will not let go, Bob. He will not let go. He says, I'm going to win this race, but this time he does. And now the question is, is Ernie going to be able to pull away? Meanwhile, Brett Bodine, Bill Elliott, and the others have closed in on these two. While these two guys have been racing, look, we've got a six-car battle for the lead. One through six are running nose to tail with now ten laps to go in the inaugural Brickyard 400. And look who's running in sixth position, Benny. It's Dale Earnhardt. Man, oh, man. I tell you what, this race might have had a little boring spot about uh, from lap 150 miles to about uh, 300, but this last 100 miles has been all worth it. What a great race. Both of these drivers who are running first and second were born in the state of California, and the last California-born driver to win at Indianapolis was Pat Flaherty in 1956. Gordon looks to the inside in three. Jeff can run as long as he doesn't have somebody right behind him, but these cars, when they pull up right behind that limit, they're getting him loose. Or they're using all that racetrack when they come off two and four, right up against that outside retaining wall. And Ray Evernham has told Jeff Gordon to stay on Ernie's tail and get him loose. the same order down the back stretch. Just a couple of feet separating Irvin from Gordon. Folks, you just can't imagine what's going through. Well, you can't imagine what's going through these drivers' minds. Just think about the thing that you wanted most in your life. And that's exactly what they're thinking right now. Jackaroot has more from Jeff's pit. Benny, here's what's going to happen. And Bob, the team down here on pit side is going to make the call when they want Jeff Gordon to try and attempt the pass. They want him to stay right where he is for right now. And they say, we'll call you when we want you to go to the front. Exactly, Jack. They, they don't want him to get in front too soon because Ernie will get him loose again, as he did a moment ago. With two or three laps to go, two or three laps to go, Jeff Gordon will try to make this move. 
Well, there has never been a pass on the last lap to win at Indianapolis 500. The latest pass occurred in 1989 on lap 198 when Emerson Fittipaldi and Al Unser Jr. battled. Why do you reckon these people pay these good money for these seats but don't sit down, Bob? <laughs> I don't think they've been sitting for most of the day. It's been a tremendous race. And we still have no idea who is going to win. Will it be Ernie Urban or Jeff Gordon or one of the four that trail them? Yes, Gordon is up on that back bumper right now. He's getting Ernie a little bit loose as he comes off these corners. As he comes off one, two, three, and four. He's trying to worry him to death right now. He wants Ernie to look up and see nothing but the white of his eyes. He wants to smile at Ernie and see so he can see his teeth when he looks in that rearview mirror and know that he's right there on that back bumper. When they come down and cross the line, we'll have six laps to go. Gary Gerald has a situation regarding Ernie Urban. Well, we're checking with the crew to see if there's been any radio conversation. They said Ernie has not complained. We asked him if he was getting loose when Gordon got up underneath that rear spoiler. They said he hasn't complained thus far. They're hanging on and hoping. Gary, there ain't nothing they can do. I mean, if he ain't got it right now, they ain't going to fix it. <laughs> If his car is not good enough to hold him back, there's nothing Robert Lear and Reynolds can do. Gordon content to stay right on the rear spoiler of Ernie Irvin for the moment, but the laps are winding down. Just a little more than five laps left to go. There, Robert is Yates, the owner of the 28 car. He watches as his driver come down, comes down and leads another lap. It's gotta be tough on those crewmen. Oh, here we go. Ernie Smith going in one. Ernie Smith and Jeff Gordon gets alongside. That wasn't on orders from the crew. That was because Ernie missed the entrance to turn one and Jeff saw it and immediately went for the hole. And something's wrong with Ernie. Something has happened to the 28 car, Bob. Urban slows down and is going to lose second position. A tire. He's got a tire going down. Urban drops off the pace and now Fred Bodine goes into second. Ernie Urban hits for the warm-up lane and Jeff Gordon has the lead. Yeah, the crew just sagged visibly on the wall. Right front tire, you hit it right on the head. And oh, in the last five laps, they were had four and a half to go, Bob. A tough break for Ernie Irvin, the NASCAR Winston Cup points leader. But again, listen to this crowd in Indiana as they cheer their boy, Jeff Gordon. Give him the win yet because the same problem could befall him before three and a half laps are over. And Ernie Urban has made it to his pit to get that flat tire fixed. But Jeff Gordon, there is the tire that has possibly cost Ernie Urban a victory here in Indianapolis. And he's going to go a lap down. He's going to go a lap down to the leaders as he comes down pit road. Here they come. It Jeff, Jeff Gordon. Gordon, Brett Bodine, Bill Elliott, Rusty Wallace, and Dale Earnhardt in that order. And then comes Darrell Waltrip. Kenny Schrader, Michael Walter. There we see Ernie as he exits the pits as Jeff Gordon goes by. 157 laps have been completed. There are two and a half to go. Here comes Ernie Irvin out of the warm-up lane with the group of cars that he was running with earlier, but he does not have a chance of winning now. Jeff Gordon has a little bit of breathing room, Benny, because Brett Bodine is maybe a second and a half behind. 
don't know. It's not that far, but we don't have far to go. Coming down for two, two laps to go, the signal this time. This is a Cinderella story that is unfolding here. Jeff Gordon, many people, including perhaps Tony George, the president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, wanted Jeff Gordon, after his outstanding performances in open wheel cars, to perhaps think about moving to the Indianapolis 500 and running the open wheel cars. But instead, Jeff Gordon chose the NASCAR stock car route. And he is on his way to a victory in the first stock car race run at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And there's his crew. They can't watch. The Rainbow Warriors did good today, didn't they? Here he comes, Bob. Off of corner number four, Doyle Ford displays the white flag. Jeff Gordon has two and a half miles to go before he wins this event. It'll be his second NASCAR Winston Cup victory. He it brings the car through corner number one, okay, and onto the short chute. There's Brett Bodine. It looks like Brett's getting a little bit closer, but does he have time? He is getting closer. On to the back stretch now with less than one half lap to go for Jeff Gordon. He eyes turn number three. Listen to the crowd as they acknowledge Jeff Gordon when he goes by. It's an unbelievable situation in Indianapolis. Here he is in the fourth turn. This is his final trip around turn number four. And Jeff Gordon is about to write his name in the racing history books. Years from today when 79 stock car races have been run here, we'll remember the name. Jeff Gordon, winner of the inaugural Brickyard 400. Man, oh man, oh man! Jeff is screaming on his radio, back to the pit crew. Oh my God, I did it! I did it! Yes! Benny, we thought we saw emotion from this kid in Charlotte. I think it'll be at least duplicated here in just a few moments. I'm about to cry. <laughs> It is an unbelievable story that has happened here at Indianapolis today. Jeff Gordon has won the Brickyard 400, and we'll be back to talk with him in just a moment. Who's in victory lane? Who's doing the interview? Jack. Jeff Ford was every one of those, wasn't he? Uh, Bob Hall. Okay.
Racing down, Jeff Gordon on your Budweiser, Pace Car, Sweepstakes, 3x5 card, and send it in. One of four 1995 Chevrolet Monte Carlo official Pace Cars could be yours. Thanks for playing, and remember to send in your game card, brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers. Here's the final pass for the lead. As down inside of Irvin, Jeff Gordon made the move. Irvin in trouble because of a tire. And Jeff hung on, coming off of turn two, he was in front. Already, Ernie Irvin has slowed completely. But Fred Bodine was not about to give it up as he began to close in and came across the line one half a second behind Jeff Gordon. So history has been made once again at Indianapolis, a whole new line of history. The 24 car of Jeff. For sure I could have, I mean, you know, I don't know, but I was in a good spot. And even if I'd have been behind him, I was in a good spot because I could get him loose. But, you know, Jeff did a good job. He had a great car all day. and. Uh, we got ours right at the end. It's just uh, the good Lord was with us. He kept us from hitting the fence, but uh, couldn't keep us from running something over. The disappointment it must be huge. You can see it in his eyes. Let's go back to the booth. All right, here is your here is your race summary now as Jeff Gordon gets his final inspection. Jeff Gordon takes the win at 131 miles an hour. We had 13 different leaders. They swapped the lead 21 times and six caution flags for 25 laps in the 160 lap run. Now, we're ready to go down to the winner's circle in front of the master control tower, and here's Jack. Well, things are a little like Bedlam here, a little different than the Indianapolis 500. Taking the congratulations. Jeff, Jeff, we'd like to get you out of the car as quickly as we can. We'd like to talk to you because you have made history. First, it was Ray Haroon, ladies and gentlemen. And now, the name is Jeff Gordon, has won the first Winston Cup race here at the famed Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Jeff, Jeff, over here, congratulations, a terrific victory, but tell us about the battle first. Oh man, what a battle. Uh, you know, we had a great car all day long, and the only car I was really worried about was that seven car, and, and uh, you know, I saw him, had, had he had his misfortune, and I thought, well, all we gotta do is just be nice and smooth and ride it here from out from here, but that wasn't true. Uh, you know, we had a caution, and uh, Ernie and and uh, the two car were right there, and and uh, I pulled away. But Ernie, uh, you know, he he kept loosening me up, so I let him go by, and then I get on him and eat his tires up and loosen him up. He let me go by. I tell you, I, I just want to commend that whole Haviland team and Ernie Irvin. He uh, he drove me a really nice, clean race. We didn't have to worry about anything. And well, I, listen, we've got a very special presentation. Behind me and behind you is the president of the international, internationally known Indianapolis Motor Speedway that is now the home of Winston Cup's Brickyard 400, Mr. Tony George, for a very special presentation. Tony? Jeff, congratulations. You've helped write history here. Your name will be the first to be inscribed on the beautiful PPG trophy for the Brickyard 400. This is yours to take home. Congratulations. Well, from Victory Lane and Spectacular, let's go back to the tower. Well, they came here with great expectations and many questions, these men of NASCAR. They came Jeff, to make history. Jeff, let's talk about Today was a validation of the great success of this series that grew up from the post-war short tracks of the South. Dreams have come true. Jeff Gordon has won the Brickyard 400. He is the champion. going to be a special
smash him. And Brett Bodine, congratulations on an outstanding effort here at the Brickyard. Well, thank you, Jerry. Uh, it all goes to the team. These guys, uh, you know, without testing, we didn't have any information on this place. No, no black book to to go by. And uh, we came here in three days and, and finished second. I want to congratulate Jeff Gordon. He had an outstanding car all day and drove a great race. And congratulations on being the the first Brickyard 400 winner. Now the incident up in turns three and four between you and brother Jeff, uh, he had some rather um, harsh comments when he climbed out of the car. What happened from your side? Well, you know, I, I had only changed two tires on that pit stop, and I knew he had better rubber on than I did, and uh, I was figuring he was going to go by me, but we got together up there in three, and I really got sideways. He got underneath me, but on the approach in the four, I had a better line than he did. So he had to come off a little slower. I got back into gas sooner, and I bumped him. It, it wasn't anything personal or anything like that, if that's what he's calling it. It was a race and accident. That's not Jeff Bodine driving to number seven. That's just number seven car, as far as I'm concerned. I get paid to try to win the race, and that's all I was trying to do is win the race. Will you two be able to talk it out? I mean, uh, it's still his family, even though you're not on the racetrack. Oh, I'm sure we will. If we don't, I'm sure my mother's going to have a conference call with us, or either that or uh, spank us and, and send us out behind the barn or something. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Fred, the next race.